powered from the Perdomo Scar Studios on the Red Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the Drew Estate Studios in California. It's episode 211 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, it's industry panel number 10 as we welcome Jeff Borshowitz, Abe DeVabna, and Dave Garofalo to the show. And as always, the Primetime Show is sponsored by Saga Cigars. Delos Race introduces another chapter of the saga, the saga Celez. Celez is a Spanish word that means leisure after work in the spirit of the standing ordeal of owning your own journey and making your own saga. The saga Celez is the perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. Saga Celez carries a blend of Criollo Olor and Peloto Cubano wrapped in a selected Ecuador Shea Claro wrapper that generously delivers with surprisingly elegance a rich and balanced smoke. It's available in three sizes at an affordable price. Ask your retailer for Saga Celez. And by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand is consistently earning the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Paramo Cigar is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Paramo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Paramo State Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double H 12 Year Vintage, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary, the Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne, Perdomo Bono Bourbon Barrel Aids, Perdomo Lot 23, Perdomo Menso 70, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Drew Estate. Drew Estate's about to make someone a whole lot richer. During its latest freestyle live show on the company's Facebook page, Drew Estate announced it is holding a Bitcoin sweepstakes with numerous incredible prizes during their freestyle live events, including a grand prize of one full Bitcoin for a lucky fan to be announced on the February 17th, 2022 edition of Freestyle Live. Entry into the unheralded Bitcoin sweepstakes is simple. During each of the company's freestyle live shows leading up to the main event, October 15th, November 11th, and January 20th, 2022, Drew Estate will select the names of five people who attend the online show and comment during specific times in each broadcast as potential winners of an assortment of fantastic prizes. The five winners from each of the shows will create a contestant poll of 15 people eligible to win the grand prize Bitcoin. You can learn more at DrewEstate.com. And remember, all the live streaming for the uh, primetime shows, as well as the California Studios for the Primetime Network shows, is sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Episode 211 here, 211, um, on this Thursday, December 2nd, 2021. Will Cooper, I'm on the red stage here in the Paranormal Scar Studios, and as always, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How are you doing tonight, Will? Oh, I'm doing good. I, I got to admit, I had the nerves tonight. I had the nerves bundled up before the show tonight. Uh, I don't know why, because you're not going to have to do a lot of talking tonight. I know I'm not, right? But it was like, <laughs> I, you know, I just, I didn't want anything to go wrong here tonight. So I was like, yeah. uh, with, with a lot of connections here, we, we have some big expectations. We got a big audience. Uh, and we just have some really, really good stuff. Aaron, before we introduce the guest, man, um, I guess uh, we are locked out with baseball for... Yes. Uh, so um, it is what it is, I guess. Yep. A bunch of people got paid and there's a bunch of people not getting paid. So. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, I hope they end this soon. Um, I don't want this. I hope I, I'm not comfortable. This is going to end anytime soon. I don't think there's a forcing function right now to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's it could go either way. It could be something that they resolve really quickly because it was just a couple of things or it could be something that someone wants to prove a point here. And there's, you know, we start walking into you know, January with this still lingering over us. And then you have to start wondering about spring training. Yep. Yep. Agree. Agree. Um, you know, Aaron, I think one of the biggest requests we've, I've pe heard people ask for a show um, is for retailers to be on the show. I, I yeah. get it a lot. Okay. Um, and we have had all these folks have been on our shows at one point or another, or one of the coop shows. Um, and, but we've, but I kind of was toying the idea with you. Can we get all three of these guys on one show? Right. Um, I put the call out to these guys and it wasn't a matter of 
hours. It was a matter of minutes. They all got back together, uh, back to me on this. Right. Um, and I was blown away and uh, I'm grateful to have all these guys here tonight. Uh, I think we're going to have an excellent show. We have, I mean, these are three, Aaron, these are the top guys. These are the top dogs in what they do. They're the best in the business. And I don't think they've all been on a show together. I think they've been on shows with one another before in, in pairs, but not as a trio. Um, so it's an honor tonight to have Jeff Borchewitz, Corona Cigar Company, Abe DeBabner of Smoke In, and Dave Garofalo of Two Guys Smoke Shop. And Dave, since I introduced you last, your cigar is going to get smoked first, which is the Abuelo tonight. So welcome uh, to primetime here. <laughs> an honor to be here. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and to be on the stage with, the, with these uh, great retailers, it's an honor to be part of it. Thank you. No, we appreciate it as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, like I said, a lot of people, the there was a lot of excitement leading into the show, which I think was uh, really, really good. Um, what we're going to cover tonight is I have it divided into like two parts here. Um, we have some topics related to the last year um, in the world of cigars. And I think we're going to get get a perspective from you guys. I think you all have, you're going to bring a unique perspective that maybe we haven't had on this show. Um, and then we'll go through some, I think, of the best practices that you guys have done. And there's certainly a lot. As I was prepping for the show, I was just amazed at, at what I was coming up with. Um, so I probably could have gone like eight hours like Bear, but we don't do the – that's Bear does the eight-hour show. So um, this is my rumor there. So um, first of all, yeah, um, let me just ask you, how are you guys all doing? Uh, good Thanksgiving? Poop, you got to call out names. I know, I know, room. I know. I already blew it. <laughs> Jeff, you're going to go first then. You're going to go first. Yes. Yeah. All right. Coop, yeah. thanks for having us on the show. This is the Grand Slam Breakfast of Denny's on your cigar show. And, uh, you know, one of the best things about how everybody replied back to Coop first is uh, we all trust Coop. And uh, we know he's never got an, a hidden agenda. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I have no idea what Coop's going to talk about or even ask us, but <laughs> we all trust him. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, uh, you know, and, and so Coop's got a good reputation. Aaron's got a good one as well. And we're here to uh, answer whatever questions you guys have. It's an open book and it's great seeing Dave. It's great seeing Abe. I wish we were all actually together around a table smoking cigars and sipping whiskey, but we'll do it through the uh, magic of the internet tonight. Abe? Um, <clears throat> this was a different Thanksgiving for us completely. Um, usually, we, you know, most of our family comes over. It's always at our house. And, um, you know, we both my wife and I have had a really, really busy couple of months. Um, and I just didn't feel like working. You know, because, I mean, Thanksgiving is work. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's people in the kitchen for two days, slaving away, baking, doing stuff. And, and it's like all over in like 10 minutes, right? So I just proposed to go out of town. And I've lived in Florida for 25 years. Thank you, baby. I live in Florida for 25 years. I've never uh, been to St. Augustine. Uh, it was our first time. So we just drove up to St. Augustine, like did nothing but relax for four days. So it was actually kind of a, it was a really wild, different Thanksgiving, but it was nice. I mean, we had hamburgers Thanksgiving dinner. There you go. I was joking with the kids. I'm like, this is going to be the Thanksgiving year. Always remember that we just had hamburgers. <laughs> that was a nice that's, time. We actually had a really nice time. That's good. That's good. And David? Uh, it, was, it was great because uh, the previous Thanksgiving was the first uh, Thanksgiving we had that the whole family didn't get together. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it happened my whole life, but that was uh, the pandemic thing was going on. And uh, it's always at my house. And nobody showed up. And even at Christmas, it was a garage Christmas where everybody got together in the garage of all places. I'm like, what's the difference? We're just freezing out here uh, with space heaters when we can be inside. But every, everybody was all panicked. So uh, this was the first year everybody got together and uh, knock on wood, everything went great. And um, we did all those things, all that, all that cooking and fast eating. But uh, I loved it. Great. You know, this was the first year uh, I spent Thanksgiving. Actually, it's the first time in a year my four kids were all together. Uh, and we were down at my daughter and son-in-law's house. So that was, it, it, when they get older 
and you have more and your family grows, it gets harder is what I'm just going to tell you. Mm. So it's not, it's something I used to take for granted. Now it's something I have to look forward to. Uh, Coop, Coop's son-in-law is now on probation for hosting. So. Oh my goodness. That was a disaster. How does he yeah. not have the football games like ready to go on, <laughs> on, on Thanksgiving was, was unacceptable. These guys wanted me to Aaron and a couple of the other guys wanted me to just lynch him. I didn't do that. But. <laughs> we just wanted to re- you revoke hosting for like five years. So you can show him how it's done. <laughs> he like, needs to learn at your feet and then he can kind of move on to his own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a disaster. That, that That's a <laughs> lucky. Uh, his father, we use his father's like, because they don't have regular TV. Now you don't just put a TV on, you know, you gotta right. have, you gotta have the access with these, uh, with the Roku and all that. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was unacceptable. I did sell him that, uh, <laughs> but he did a good job afterwards. Um, you know, in terms of scheduling this, I just want to mention this too. You know, you guys have all been like super busy and I follow you guys. Like Jeff, you had your big cross country trip, right? And then and, and going to the trade sets. You, you were doing your traveling and then you had the farm. Abe, you were dealing with the warehouse. And then Dave, I know you were dealing with the anniversary party in September when I was starting to come up with this idea. So I just kind of said, let me see if things are going to get a little easier for you guys as we all, um, as we all kind of get into this. Um, and like I said, I was, I didn't know if we were going to be able to pull it off. I threw a date out there and everyone was able to do the date, which so I'm grateful for that. So thank you guys. Um, hey, let's, so let's kind of start off. Um, let's start off with pandemic. All right. Let's talk a little pandemic here. I know it's not fun, but um, so I want to kind of just set the stage and Abe, I'll start off with you. Um, We'll go back about 18, 19 months ago when this pandemic hit, right? Um, going into the pandemic, right? Um, you, you faced some enormous challenges right out of the gate there. Um, what were some of like the key challenges that you faced from your business um, going like when, when this pandemic started? And when did it like really get to a point like, shit, this is real? I, I mean, I, I think the biggest hurdle for anybody in, in, in that situation, you know, look, for us, we literally just had wound up the Great Smoke. I, I really think it was the country's like last real event. It was. I came people. back. I was coming back from that when this stuff really started to real. And, and no one at the Great Smoke was talking about it. And this and this is like late February. Right. And everybody started closing down in March. Yeah. So like, I mean, literally, this is like weeks before the, the shit hits the fan. You know, we're like in another universe. We had a great event. And then I remember reading, and I can't remember who it was. It was like two weeks later, beginning of March, maybe mid-March. Um, some retailer put up post. Uh, we decided to close our shop, and when I was like, "What?" I mean, like, we didn't didn't really even think that this was a, a, a real thing, you know. So it was like something you read on the news. And then, as in by the end of March, you know, we made the decision. And honestly, at that point, it was against most of my staff's wishes. But we just said, look, we're going to close for a month. We closed um, the whole month of April. And I think the first week of May. And, no, last week of March and the whole month of April. So we didn't even make it the whole month of March. And um, the hardest thing, look, every, all of us are, have been in the industry now for a long time. And, and they'll all tell you, there's always some hurdle. There's always something at some point in your career that you have to make it through or get through or overcome. And it's easy when you know what's going on, but to drive down the road and not have any depth of vision or you no know, field of vision and it's everything short and you don't know what the story is and it's two weeks and uh, we're straining out the curve and then it's six months and the lounges are open, the lounges are closed. It makes it very hard for you to come out with any kind of plan. So you don't know even how to handle finances. I mean, I, honestly, I was looking for a new house. I stopped looking, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I didn't know what to expect that year. And, and I think that was the really hardest thing is that, you know, whatever the, the, the lounge is being closed, the bars being closed, keeping our employees staffed, you know, and then and then still trying to connect with consumers who were starting to smoke more and do it in a way that we could still communicate and kind of have this culture and lifestyle that we all kind of love and share every day. You know, that was something that, you know, I think the, the people who, who really were trying and figured out and, 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 and were able to connect, but just to be able to run the company without really knowing the future, when are we going to open? If we're going to open, 
you know, that was the hardest thing because there was no definitive plan, no timeline. You know, it was, it, that was, that was our, my, my biggest challenge. If I got a problem, I could, I, I could work it out. I mean, I always feel I could work it out, right? There's some way, there's something I could do. I can maneuver, but it was, you can't do it when you don't know what, what's ahead. And then that was, that was my biggest thing during the, during the pandemic, you know, outside of, outside of trying to stay safe and keep healthy and keep your family healthy too, because, you know, half the time, you know, they had me baking paper in the oven and mail in the oven at one point. You know, because I was all freaked out. Like, you know, when the mail came in, I put it in the oven for like, you know, 250 degrees for like 30 minutes because I didn't want to touch anything coming from the outside world, you know. So it was it was emotional. It was trying. It was trying as a family. But, you know, in in the greater schemes of things and what, you know, generations have gone throughout t- history and time, I can't say we had it that bad. Sure, sure. Now, Jeff, you're in the same state, Florida. Um, this impacted your businesses as well. It did, but uh, whenever we talk about COVID, man, that's a rabbit hole that I'm not so sure we should go down during this show. We might get <laughs> the, uh, the feed will probably get pulled as soon as I start talking about it, so we'll skip that part. But uh, for us, what I we were we were fighting every every step of the way because um, you know there was we have stores and three different cities, three different counties, and you had states, counties, and cities that were all putting out rules every day. So it was constantly watching. And then, you know, you'd post that you could do this and the next day you couldn't. So um, for us, it was just watching a lot of reading the tea leaves of what was happening and being proactive and then figuring out ways to, uh, to uh, I don't want to say work around it, but to operate through it. Um, my mindset was always the same. I got to, you know, if the Publix next door or the Walmart and Target and all the Fortune 500 companies weren't closed, but the mom and pop independent businesses were too dangerous to go to, um, you know, I had a problem with that. And especially uh, Abe and I actually worked together along with uh, a couple Brian. other shop owners, uh, Brian down in Miami. Um, Ryan Leeds was, uh, you know, he was dealing with it down in Miami. He was in West Palm and us in Tampa and Orlando. And so we were, you know, the bars were closed and they had us closed for a while, several months. And they, and they kept telling us there's no, you know, they were like, we're like, well, when can you open? They're like, oh, you know, we don't know. And we actually, they kind of gave the, the direction that they didn't give, they didn't care. They really didn't care about having um, bars open, especially bars and nightclubs. But, um, you know, we kept working through it, kept arguing the point that literally for us, we had restaurants next to us that were allowed to be open and you could sit there and have a meal. But somehow if you sat, you know, six feet over at Corona Cigar, you were going to die. So it's like we, it, the rules were just so unfair. So, um, you know, I'm always heavily, heavily involved in politics and I, I scrap through everyone. Any, anytime they come at us with bad things, I always you got to push back because if you don't, you, there's only one side of the story that's ever being told. So um, we we worked through it, but all three of us retailers here uh, were diversified before COVID started. So that gave us a major um, advantage um, because for the cigar industry, uh, which which I really didn't expect that that part kind of caught me off guard, is that during COVID, um, for every sale we lost uh, with stores being closed we were able to pick it up with our mail order sales. So for a company, um, you know, our, our sales didn't go down at all. It actually went up, but, but at the same time, that's, we, we would rather have had retail stores open cigar bars open and mail order operating the way it was before. Um, but like I said, we hammer through it. I just will caution everybody. You gotta, you really need to pay attention to what's going on here because, uh, the, the lockdowns, they would love to bring them back. Uh, they're doing it in other countries. If they could do it uh, here all the way across America, they would love to. So you've just got to watch what's going on. There's certain news sources that you can really see what's going on and you're not going to find them through your you know, mainstream media. But uh, if, you, if you really stay informed on this, you can make wise decisions. But the secret is you got to watch the programs that tell you not to watch because that's where the info lies. Right, right. Now, David, 
you well I, uh yeah with, with these guys god bless ron DeSantis. everybody yeah. uh in new england wanted to move to florida and half of them did by the way um and it, it's, as bad as it had for you you were in the best state in the country i think um that was kind of eased up uh much like abe said the unknown is the biggest thing uh, to an entrepreneur, and especially in the cigar industry, even FDA, we don't, we don't know what's happening to FDA still. I always said, whatever's going to happen, just let it happen years ago so I can move on with my life and figure out what the hell I'm going to do because this thing sitting on the sidelines, don't know whether to do it or not because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. The same thing was happening doing during this epidemic that can we open, can we not open? Uh, you know, my, my staff was panicked and uh, I looked at each one of them and I said, here's the deal. Um, we're gonna do this curbside service thing. If anybody feels funny about it, we have too many employees anyway, just to do it, stay home if you want to. Everyone's gonna get paid no matter what, knock on wood. Uh, we had enough reserves to be able to get through it. And I know, you know, th these folks are, are, are living paycheck to paycheck. I said, don't worry about a thing. But I'll tell you, after about six weeks or so, I don't care how you're doing, it's starting to chip away at, at, at uh, your business. And you go, wow, after all this time, is this, is this how I'm gonna go down? That the government is gonna make it so, same, same as Jeff said, Across the street is Home Depot, wide open, um, a gas station that actually serves, sells cigars at the gas station. It's okay to go in there too. That was essential. And I was so bothered by the I'm not essential. They, they are. It's just not fair. But I've been in the cigar business for 37 years. I'm used to what's not fair anyway. But I need to know what the hell's going on so I can make a, make a move at that point. And it was very tough. But again, diversification, um, you know, this is uh, the, the online business is nothing new. It's been out there for a long time. And all of us got into that, got into multiple stores, got into uh, different areas, all these um, insurance policies, basically, is what I'll call them. In case the shit hits the fan here, you got this just in case that happens. You got this. And, um, you know, it, if anything, I think uh, other brick and mortar retailers maybe learned a lesson and said, let me get a little diversification. All eggs can't be in one basket because if something goes wrong with that basket, you're screwed. Sure. Yeah. Do you mind if I make a follow up, follow up com a comment absolutely, here? Absolutely, Jeff. Go ahead. Go so, ahead. Dave, Dave, one of the issues that you might have had up in New Hampshire too is that, um, like, if in in our case where it was it was safe to have a, a you know a cocktail and a dinner at a restaurant right next to our stores, but it was you know deadly if you did it in a cigar store. The, I, I cannot stress enough how important it was to have, like. Ryan leads down in Miami, pushing his state legislator, Abe pushing in West Palm, myself pushing in Tampa and Orlando. So when Governor DeSantis sent their, their guy that was in charge of, of all the bars, every stop he made in Florida, he was getting pounded about why can't we sell, why can't we smoke cigars in a cigar shop? Why can't we serve drinks? And yet you can do it others. And honestly, I think we wore him down. I know that I know that by the time he got to Orlando, actually went to Orlando, then he went to to uh, Lake Mary where other stores. We were at both of them, so the guy was sick and tired of hearing this stuff. But but if you don't continue to you know put that pressure on, because honestly, it's like you know they say you know justice is supposed to be blind, and it's like how can you argue that if the mm. restaurant right next door to us is essential or it's safe there, but it's not safe one table over at the next tenant? You, you can't look at someone a straight face and say, yeah, you're you're going to get hurt, you know, or danger there. So anyway, I, I just want to reiterate that for any retailers that are watching this, when you hit these state issues, try and cover every corner of your state, because then it becomes instead of a Dave Garofalo issue or an Abe issue or a Jeff issue, it becomes shit. All these, you know, cigar retailers are like, yeah. they're pounding us on us. That's the key. Yeah. And and. Uh, you, you're 100% right. The people that say you can't fight City Hall must have been the politicians that wrote that because you can and you must fight City Hall and go down fighting uh, and you can win. And I've done it many times. I know we all have, um, but a lot of the people just get complacent and allow this type of behavior to happen and not fight back because it's a grind. There's no doubt about it. It's, there's nothing fun about it, but uh, the alternative is that you're out of business. And we saw 
our uh, gyms and, and restaurants and all this stuff up here, places that were, were in business, Boston Institution, restaurants that were there for 150 years, gone. COVID actually ruined them because the, the government of Massachusetts said, no, you're not going to be able to open. And they end up giving up. And you're talking about the old, oldest restaurants in the United States, gone. And that's what took them out. And, and I know, like, I saw some kind of unique things that you guys did. Dave, you literally had, like, a pop-up store outside your store. I think you had the samplers, like, out there. Jeff, you had people in your back by the alligators, I guess, <laughs> with, with an outdoor lounge, you know. Uh, you know, Abe, you, you obviously did some things with, with, the, with some of the virtual stuff. And, and uh, you know, you all kind of got creative, I think, with these types of things. Um, during this time and I give you guys credit for that. Let me make a comment about that that alligator cigar lounge we had. <laughs> so that was organic by we have a No, I know it wasn't device. you. Yeah, I want to get clear. No, no, but you. but I, I want to give you an example here of what was what was not good what was going on is when we weren't allowed, when we weren't allowed to have anybody in the stores. The people that would always congregate. Remember a cigar shop is is like the uh, it's the meeting place of, of, there's not a lot of places anymore that people meet, congregate, and speak to each other. Uh, you go to a Starbucks, everybody's just looking at their iPad, their iPhones. They don't talk to each other. So anyway, so you have a, a group of people that still wanted to meet with each other. So they had to meet in secret. So in our place, they met behind the store next to a dumpster, next to a retention pond where the alligators hang out. <laughs> and here, and, and so they did that on their own, right? So that wasn't that wasn't us setting out. Right. That was individual people having their you know their freedom. Of, you could ride a bike and stuff. So anyway, they wanted you to exercise. So the guys were like, "Hey, we ride our bike down there from a cigar. We walk down there." So anyway, the crazy part is, is we literally had citizens trying to turn other citizens in. There was posts wow. on Facebook where they were writing to this. We had some really wacko people. I'd see on the mayor's Facebook feed, I'd see it on the city council guys and stuff. Hey, there's a group of people at Corona Cigar in the back smoking cigars. You know, what do we, we, we got to do something. Who do I call? Which police department? Which, I mean, literally, this is a conversation going on on Facebook. I get a, I get a, a text Sunday morning from a customer saying, Jeff, go look at this feed. I'm like, holy smokes. And it was just a, it wasn't a good thing where you start having people going after people Man. Like it, it's just, I never, I never seen it like it. it turned people against each other in a way that I, I, I didn't never expect. And so anyway, those things happened, but believe me, there were some repercussions of it. And, and, and people even said, listen, dude, I, you know, how are you going to stop people from meeting together uh, outside in a parking lot behind a business, you know, in, you know, hiding amongst some bushes or something. I mean, that's anyway, that's what went on with that. But the, like I said, I just want to give you the feedback of, of, the bad side. Wow. Wow. Abe, what's changed for you coming out of the pandemic? Um, and what has changed from your business that maybe before the pandemic wasn't the case? Well, I mean, for me personally, the pandemic was almost um, on a business level, kind of like a it, it kind of revitalized me. Um, you know, when you're doing this 25 or 30 years, like Dave, almost 40 years, you know, you, you get in the routine of what you do, you know, and you do, you know, your things and your whatnots. And, but um, I kind of felt like I did when I first got in the business 25 years ago, trying to navigate and come up with creative ways and the creative juices got flowing and, we found great new ways to connect with people and do events in a different ways. And I mean, the great smoke was a perfect example of it this earlier this year. I mean, that was to look back on it now, and even now, I mean, then I watch it again. I'm like, wow, what were we thinking? I mean, it was just such an absurd idea to even attempt, you know, we're tobacconists. No one has broadcast media experience. We have no clue what we're doing. And we put on this major thing. And that was, that, that's what changed for me personally. I mean, it just, it just revitalized me. 
Um, and and honestly, our whole company has changed. We just like we just opened our first new warehouse. Our reach, our fans, the culture expanded for us. And I I feel like I like I did like literally twenty years ago. And um, it's kind of an exciting time for us now. You know, I I, I we live in Florida and. You know, kind of doesn't always sound great to say, but it's really, you know, for the last year, like since really kind of, it opened up what, last October, Jeff, completely? Yeah, um, yes. We've been living very differently than the rest of the country. I mean, like, literally <laughs> very differently. Like, we, we travel, we forget. Yeah. Like I got on a flight and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't bring a mask. Cause like, <laughs> you've, you've forgotten. Cause it's really, you know, kind of like been a whole different universe, especially I have family in Chicago and man, what they went through and, and what they're going through. And I got friends in Detroit and, um, you know, it's, it's a shame. It really is, but we've been fortunate enough. Um, and uh, it's changed, not just my company dramatically, but just us. And even the stuff we've been doing has excited my team. So it, 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 my company has literally like, completely inside and out has, has developed in such a different way in the last 18 months that we would have never seen coming. And it's become a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of work, but it's become a lot of fun. Good. No, I could definitely, I, I definitely have seen that obviously from even what we changed at KMA, you know, we, the whole, that whole show changed, as you know, we went out of the studio. Well, we, yeah. We got shut down for like six weeks because we yeah. never did nothing virtually. Yeah. We worked out of a studio and it always been a studio and then when when i heard media said well sorry guys you can't come in our building anymore we weren't prepared it literally took us four to five weeks to really figure out how to do a broadcast from all our homes um we had never used any kind of software like that and it, about maybe four or five months before we really tweaked it and got it to look really good and i'm very proud of how it looks now i think it looks better than it ever did you know our our, our programming and, and still being virtual um and and things things I don't think are ever going to go back. I mean, even this year we're doing the Great Smoke, we're doing it live again, but we're incorporating a whole virtual side because I just don't think we can go backwards. You know, people have seen it, they've experienced it. We've gotten we got hundreds of emails from people who begged us not to not have it virtual again because they can't take the time off of work or for. Listen, if you go to one of these cigar events and you're traveling, you're spending a lot of money before you even get there between airfare and hotel. So it's become a very tangible thing for consumers. So yeah, I don't think our event's ever going to be the same. So here I am 16 years into doing it and we're doing it again for the first time, you know? So, you know, you do the same thing over and over again, you change this, change that, but it's kind of, you know, the same event. Now, we're, again, after a historic event last year, we're doing it different. We're going to have like the Ryan Seacrest New Year's Eve uh, studio live going to correspondence. It's crazy. These are ultimately crazy ideas, but we're having fun. That's good. Yeah, I definitely have seen it. How about you, David? What's changed for you? Well, first off, uh, I have to applaud Abe for uh, that event he did. And, and I contacted him as soon as I saw it because I thought it was amazing and good for our entire industry. Uh, sensational. And the risk, I know what these things cost. The risk is dramatic that this could have bombed and done nothing. And he took that risk and he did it. And that was good for my business. It's good for everybody in the cigar business. Listen, there isn't a shoe store that put on an event like that. There isn't a uh, restaurant, uh, any retail store. Can you imagine a retail store did something like that? Holy God, it's just amazing. And, and that goes for all of us that are in the cigar industry that we put on big events that end up happening. And, and think about it, your supermarket doesn't down the street doesn't put on a big event. Uh, it, it's so weird that the cigar industry of all things do these type of risky things. And sometimes I, I've been on it. I've been on the on the losing end of a major event that I did. And then you got to make up for it the next one or something. But it's marketing, right? The, at the end of it, it's you've marketed yourself um, and the cigar industry to a bunch of people that may have never even been interested in the cigar industry at all. And they get in there. So Thank you for that, Abe, because it was huge. It was it was good for all of us. I, I guess uh, you and Jeff reached out to me that that weekend. Both it was unbelievable. I got texts from both of you. And I'm going to tell you, you, know, you know, Dave, you're older. Jeff and I, you're we're roughly the same age. But you two are guys I looked up to 
in this industry, right? I mean, you guys, you guys were much larger, much earlier than than we were, and we were playing catch up or whatever. So I, I, I ain't gonna lie, I'm telling everybody to get those texts from you guys that weekend was a very touching moment for me. And I ain't gonna lie, Dave, I said it all the way up into the show when everybody asked me. I said, look, this is either gonna be an epic, epic <laughs> event or it's gonna be an utter failure. And I, at this point, it's about a 50-50 shot. Right. There's so many technical things that could have went wrong and there's no rehearsal, there's no production, there's no, it is live. I mean, it really was 50-50 going into this. I'm like, it was the point where Michael and I were having uh, lunch the day, the day before and he ordered the same dish I did. I'm like, Michael, don't eat the same thing I'm eating. <laughs> that's, a, poison. I mean, yeah, that's how crazy I, I had thought during that thing. I mean, it was nice, but I deeply, I don't even know what I ever talked about. I deeply appreciated the text that I got from both of you guys. That thank you very much. Well, 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 well deserving. Yep. It, I was I was blown away when I watched it, and just the, I watched the whole thing, and the the fact there was no technical snafus throughout it either, because you know even Abe just put this in perspective. How many times have you seen on you know big networks, CNN and stuff like that, yep. and then they try to go to the reporter that's you know over there and, and their mic doesn't work or something oh we oh that feed didn't work whatever man you're you went on for like what eight hours or something and it, it was that was amazing especially the, for the first time so that's that's where i was like wow this is a this was man it it, it didn't look like the first time at all no, and uh, no. it, it was that was that was super super impressive plus you know i i told abe the part where his daughter was playing the 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 violin i was like wow that was pretty cool man I was, yeah you know because yeah so anyway it was great the guy the guy singing the theme music it, it was a jerry lewis telethon for those that remember the jelly jerry lewis telethons it, it was awesome and, and, was, and uh good did, for our industry as i say that's the way i described it, it was jerry lewis telethon and qbc had a baby like they had a baby this is what we gotta try to do that's literally what you gotta be a little older to know what we're talking about but that's literally the example of it. Well, yeah that, that, that was it so it, as far as me uh when the shutdown ended up happening i said you know at the end of this thing when it gets cleared up people where are they going to be the day after I should have did this? I should have did that. So I said, okay, this is going to be, I'm gut in the attic. I'm redoing, remodeling the stores. Um, I can get contractors now uh, that I'll let in the back door if they want to end up working. And people I know, it's like our customers and stuff, but this is what they do for a living. They're down and out. So, uh, okay, if you want to do it, you're welcome to it. Nobody will even be on the second floor. You can be up there yourself or bring your, your guys in with you, whatever you want to do. So I started working on these things, and I made a function room on the second floor uh, so that I can sit 50 people at a sit-down dinner to start doing my own cigar events in the store because I'm not going to be able to do cigar events. And believe me, the second that they opened it up, that I was allowed to do it in the store. And still the, the function halls weren't allowed to be open because that's typically where we end up doing our events. We start monthly cigar dinners inside the store to this day, and we have everything all set up to be able to do it. I just wanted to make sure I came out of this thing and something ended up happening during this, as opposed to, yeah, I stayed home. I gained 40 pounds. I did gain the 40 pounds, but I didn't stay home. <laughs> So Dave, I want to that we did the same thing where we remodeled bathrooms and reconfigured a few things in our Sand Lake store. But what I what I found was interesting is that the you know they had so many they had things that were called essential and non-essential. But what was very interesting, the government, the local government that issues the permits, those guys must have been non-essential because it took a year to get oh, yeah. permits to get any plumbing and electrical. So the bottom line, I guess the government's not essential. That's what they're saying. I agree. Wow. So do you have anything else that you changed as far as coming out of this thing? Well, I, I, I'm not saying we're not out of this thing yet. That's the whole thing. Yeah. So, right. so we're not out of this. And right. even though we, we should be out of it, but the, you, I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but this thing, there's right. a reason why we're not out of it. It's going to continue. It's never going to stop. So anyway, so we just got to, you got to be prepared for, for, you know, them always trying to lock down and, and, uh, and once again, 
thank God we're in Florida. Because believe it or not, Ron DeSantis is getting hammered. He's our governor of Florida, keeps everything open. There are lunatics out there that are still saying he did it wrong. And we should be locked down like New York. We should be locked down like California. And it's like, this, this is crazy. And so, so anyway, we're, we're, let me get to the real bottom line of this too. This is why elections matter and votes matter. Ron DeSantis kind of squeaked by in that election. We almost had a governor that would have been like what you have in California yeah. or what you have in New York. So that's why I tell people elections matter and pay attention to what's going on because you could, things could have been very different in Florida if we would have had Andrew Gillum, who was a Soros back candidate and would have been really, really fun. She, he would have governed Florida the same way the mayor of Chicago is governing Chicago. So that's how close we were. There's a fork in the road. And fortunately the people in Florida made the right choice. Very, very, very good. The last question, just and we'll, we'll move away from this pandemic stuff. We, you know, let each has asked this individual. We all surprised kind of how this, gro- like there was this, like it looked like a doomsday scenario for a lot of retailers. If you go back to March of 2020, but lemonade out of lemons, uh, everyone seemed to grow. I don't want to say everybody. You guys all seem to kind of find a way to grow your business one way or another in different in different avenues. And if I'm reading that wrong, let me know. But I think a lot of you had you know, have benefited from a lot of the new cigar smokers and maybe that came in on this. So give me some thoughts on that. Um, we'll start with Abe. You know, there's truth to be told where sometimes a little luck goes a long way. So for us as a company, um, and Jeff won't remember this, but I, I it was 2018 and um, I texted him out of the blue because it was the first time since we had started our e-commerce business that we are having a very bad year. And I didn't know, is it me? Is it what's going on in the industry? So I literally sent Jeff a text and said, look, I, you know, nothing specific, but I, you know, I, I, we were having a bad year. I just said, are you flat? You know, are you, how are things experiencing and, and, and whatnot? And um, I made a conscious decision at the very end of 2018 to really work hand personally I literally sat with my operations guy. I said, listen, I don't, I don't want to run the retail anymore. You know, you, you, you've worked under me now for six years. You know what you're doing. Handle the retail store. I, I need to focus on the e-commerce side of the business. And um, I've really worked really hard in 2019 to really put us out there and connect with people nationally like we do locally, which we have been very successful with. And that just really had primed us up for when this pandemic hit. We weren't, we really had become probably twice as known and even though the stores shut down, um, we were really fortunate enough to, to have gotten that exposure right before the pandemic. And we had gotten inundated and I was blessed because I got to keep all my people employed. We had bartenders writing letters and packing packages. And, you know, we, we kept everybody going even when we shut the store down. And, and it was very fortunate for us. Um, I forgot what your question was. The, the question was the surprise that kind of, there was this, a lot of new cigar smokers came in and it wasn't the doomsday scenario. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, so look, I mean, we, we didn't know that was going to happen. So obviously when you shut six, seven retail store doors down, you're like, holy cow, because all that means you got that much more overhead as any of these guys will tell you. And we didn't expect it. So we ended up being blessed and a little luck worked for us where, like Jeff said, you know, whatever we lost, we were, we were able to make it up on that level which is, is, is one of the things, and, and Jeff, all three of us, I think may have sat on the board at the same time. I think th- when I served- Dave, I, you, came, you came, Dave and I did, and you came when I, after I came off, you were on there. No, but, no, no, you were def- you and I were definitely on there for one year. We were definitely, because I remember, because yeah, you and I- that's we, right, that's right. That's, you and I yes. were screaming murdered when, when the Jenkins Act was on the table. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I remember that. So, but- Oh, but you know, that's something I remember even way back then because our <laughs> philosophy, you know, you should make retailers better retailers. You know, that, that's yeah. the kind of the board, help them be better retailers. I mean, there's better ways to get business. And, um, you know, it worked, you know, at the end it worked out for us. But it, like Jeff said, it, it, not only is it not over politically and pandemically, man, it, it's everything's an uphill battle. Getting things. Just hold, cars, let me pitch. Employees. Abe. 
Abe, Dave, real quick. Can you imagine if mm. the association went with that crazy freaking idea of supporting the We were the, the only Act? three. We were the that only was, three. That was insane. <laughs> so anyway. We were the only um, three out of what? Ten people at the time? A lot of people yeah, don't know what this it, means. It, and it looks Jenkins self-serving. Yeah. It looks self-serving, but it wasn't. <laughs> because those same people have an e-commerce going at, at hey, this point, too, and it, it saved their life. It was only self-serving to those people who wanted to back it. Yeah. That's really what it was. Why would you ever fight for more government regulation? I mean, right. That, that the Jenkins, whole, the, explain what the Jenkins Act, for people that are watching this, the Jenkins Act was essentially would have made it illegal to sell cigars uh, online mm -hmm. through mail order. It would have applied the same regulations for cigarettes to cigars. You yeah, can't sell cigarettes online. So that's what Jenkins yeah. Act was. You and can't so had, cross state borders. You can't yeah. cross state borders except cigars. So they said, well, we'll just put a line through except cigars. I don't know if we we're even supposed to be talking like this, but that was, <laughs> that was the gist of it. And uh, listen, I, I've been on that board uh, for, for two terms and um, when three people don't want to happen and the other seven do, you never win. But for whatever reason, whatever strong person, we were adamant. We, we would let them move on. <laughs> Listen, I'll never forget. One of you two went to the bathroom when it started. And I'm like, where are they? <laughs> we need another guy back in this room. And, and I remember asking them at the time, I said, look, you, you're supposed to represent the, the cigar you know, industry as a whole. Can you tell me? Because before we had a website, I had been shipping because we're in Florida, we're seasonal. Patrons come down, they vacation, we get they call us up when they go home. I've been running to the post office for 25 years before we even had a website, you know? So, you know, I said, can you even tell me how many, what percentage of your membership ships products to people out of state? They couldn't even answer that question. No, how can how can you represent your 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 group? If you don't know that number and want to endorse this, but I'll never forget that after because I think at the time I, I'm pretty sure at the time I was the youngest guy in the room, you know, I, I was the fresh blood, young blood, you know, and you know I'm, I'm looking at all these people who are like my elders and guys who are way more in the time in the industry. I'm like, are we really having this conversation? Yeah, I, I do remember how it ended, how we won, because I said to them, please don't anybody do a motion to vote on this. Because now you'll have to vote. Your name's going to have to go on there as you yeah. voted against it. You're going to have to die with that thing. Please yeah. don't do, do a motion. And nobody ended up doing it. Went away or it was tabled it was the tabled. next time. It was tabled. Yeah. God knows the efficiency of the, of the board. So <laughs> he probably never brought it back up again. Right. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's There's true. some real cigar history for you people out there. There we go. Yeah, a little insight there. There you go. It's yeah. like well, I didn't. I had no idea that was going to come up. What are we oh. talking about? Here, so. No, that's, this is great stuff here. Great stuff. Um, Dave, close it out with you. A anything like surprised you? You know, in terms of how I don't want to say come out of this, but better, maybe a better place in this doomsday scenario. Everyone thought back in last year. Yeah. So, so I, I, I separate my online business from my regular business. So I know just what the retail stores do. And we were so far behind. I never thought in a million years that we would uh, make the number for the year. I said, we're way behind. This is going, going to go back many years uh, because of of the loss that we took for a few months of being completely, you know, people driving up to your thing and running out to the car. Uh, you know, I'm a pretty high volume retail store. There was no way that was going to work, nor did it, but it was something coming in anyway. And uh, I just got, could not believe by the time we hit November of that year, we had exceeded the previous year, which was so large to begin with, I said, I just can't believe this. I would have lost. A, a, I would have bet it all. There was, there was no way that we could have hit it. And we exceeded it. And, you know, you're saying um, that it was new cigar smokers. I don't know how much of new cigar smokers, uh, because we, we keep record of that also. Mm -hmm. But it was consumption of regular cigar smokers. Yeah. The consumption went way up. Guys that would smoke 
one or two cigars a week were smoking one or two cigars a day. Or and they were telling me, and I was asking the question because they could, they had the time to do it. This is a product that you actually need time for. And we're all running around like crazy people, no matter what businesses the people are in. And they're just too busy to have time to relax. And if one thing they got during COVID is a lot of time. And the competition was great because you couldn't go to a nightclub, you couldn't go to restaurants, you couldn't go spend your money at ball games or anything. So there was a few things you could do. One was drink and one was smoke cigars. And they did both. And they did both in, in, in a big way. Uh, another thing, listen, I watched all you guys. I pay attention to this industry big time, especially both of you. And Jeff, you started selling your alcohol combination with <laughs> the cigars, which, oh, my God, I'm looking at that and I go, holy shit, you know, just when you thought you're doing good and this guy's doubling up on that side and <laughs> putting packages together, it was fabulous. So one of the things that, that I agree totally with what Dave said, that I don't think we had so many new cigar smokers. It was definitely consumption in, in, in time, but also there's there's good and bad about the work from home thing or work from it's not even home. You just working remotely. So uh, we saw in our places, guys were working from our shops and working, you know, at the tables outside, they'd have their, ear, you know, ear pods in and doing zoom calls like this while they're working. So they were able to smoke cigars at work where they never were able to do that in the past. So um, I, I agree. It was more of a, an increase in consumption and just the availability to smoke cigars. I'm sure we picked up some new people just because people saw other people. Someone made a comment the other day that you go, you know, I drive by this uh, where Heathrow stores, and they're like, man, everything else that was empty, but Corona cigars freaking full outside. People smoking cigars left and right. So, you know, people are definitely, uh, I, I, if you see a lot of people enjoying themselves and a lot of people, hey, man, that looks pretty, they look like they're all happy, you know, let me, let me see what's going on over there. So I'm sure we picked up a few there, but most of it was definitely, uh, customers just spending more, more on us, more on cigars and smoking more. Uh, one little, one little thing I'll tell you, I did a commercial years ago for the store and we had a film crew come in and people are sitting around and talking with each other. And this was part of the thing and, and it's being narrated as it's going on. And when we brought it uh, before the TV station that we're going to run the commercial on, they said, um, okay, we're going to have to edit this commercial down. Um, there's certain parts we don't like here. And I said, well, what's the problem with it? Uh, I made sure that the cigar, uh, they didn't actually take a drawer of the cigar during it because that was one of the things. There's all kinds of crazy stuff when it comes to it. And they said, it looks like these people are having too good of a time. And I said, well, this is real life. This is what a cigar shop yep. is. No, I will not. Uh, take that out. And they said, no, it looked, it, it just too much enjoyment going on here. And one of the stations wouldn't do it. And I had to, you know, keep passing it down from station to station till I could find somebody to put it on. But it looked like it was too good of a time and people would want to consume cigars that didn't consume cigars because it looked like it was a good time. This is the argument that the TV station had with me. And I said, well, this is the way it is. And I'm not, and I'm not, not doing it. You can not take my money, which is fine, but this commercial stays as it is. And uh, yeah, they wouldn't do it. Wow. So Dave, th those people that said that to you are now doing the fact checking for Facebook, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. All right. Oh, good stuff, guys. Hey, let's move. Let's move away from pandemic and talk. Talk some really uh, cool stuff here. Um. All right. Um. 2021. Uh, we're hearing a lot of stuff around supply and demand right now. Um, and it's taking place. I mean, I, I, I actually saw some pictures in Europe, right? And I think Europe's a lot worse in terms of some of these supply problems that are happening than maybe here, for sure, from what I've seen. But let me kind of ask you guys right now, um, in terms of getting supply, getting cigars right now uh, versus the demand, um, how, is, how is that affecting you? And Abe, we'll start off with you on that. I mean, it's, I mean look, if you're in this industry, you've had, you've had back orders throughout your career. It's just the amount of back orders in the last year or so is way higher than normal. And you try to compensate and you try to order more, but can't squeeze blood from a stone that's not there. It's, it's, it's not so bad lately. It's more now instead of being more across the board with kind of everybody being short in cigars, 
certain companies a little bit more, certain lines a little bit more, but no, we're, we're not getting, it's not just a cigar scoop. It's other facets. We couldn't find black straws for the bar. I mean, I mean, you, you don't realize just the, the normal day-to-day stuff that's disappearing and you can't find. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's more than just the cigar side of the business. You know, I mean, listen, Jeff, Jeff is, uh, I like to call him the neon Dion or the Bo Sanders, you know, of our industry because you know, he's made it in two sports. You know, he's become a leader in two industries and, you know, I'm sure he'll tell you because the liquor companies are out of liquor, having a hard time getting some liquors. You know I mean? Like I'll go to the bar some nights. I'm like, how are we out of that? I'm like, man, they haven't had it in two weeks. You know, it's, 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 it's um, not the same. It's not level. It's, it's, look, you can't, I'm not a complainer. So, you know, you just make a do, you do what you got, but no, uh, there's still hurdles to be had, but nothing, nothing that nobody's going to not overcome. It's just keeps you from operating your business as efficiently and as profitably as you like. How about you, David? Well, I, I lived through it before. I got in the business in 1985 when you can get all the cigars you want, and they were happy to have you. Uh, come 1990, all of a sudden, a, a cigar boom gets created, and by the mid-90s, or even earlier than that, um, a, a major shortage happened, and um, at that time, I was too green. I didn't understand what to do, and uh, when a customer wanted Brand X, and I don't have Brand X, Maybe they're going to walk out of the store. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Uh, the consumer is going to take something else. Knock on wood. Uh, we haven't had anybody leave out of the store. Uh, you know, come in. Their favorite cigar isn't in there. Uh, I think they understand uh, is, is a big part of it. They're understanding what it is. And here's the closest thing I have to it. Maybe it's the same brand, a different size. Maybe it's a, a, a different line of cigars from the same country or whatever we can do. But our employees are trained well enough to find the next best thing. So I warn the manufacturers who short ship us that, listen, they come in the first time and they ask for brand X. I tell them brand X isn't in. The second time they come in, I sold them something. They come in and ask for brand X again and I sell them something else or the same secondary brand that they wanted and liked. And you know something, the third time they come in, they don't ask for brand X again. So now they have a new thing and they forgot about brand X. So they have to be leery of that too, that they got a good chance of, you know, they can push that stuff to the online discounters or they can give it to the brick and mortar hand sell type of stores uh, because you're losing the customer the manufacturer is losing a customer. I'm not losing a customer. I, I have something for them anyway. So um, th- that is a big uh, problem that they have. They have to be smart. You know, we, we always say that a retailer has to be smart. The manufacturers have to be smart because when the boom was over last time in 1997, the majority of cigar manufacturers or brand owners went out of business. The majority of them went. And the same thing could happen this time uh, if somebody starts forgetting about their brand. And it, and I understand that their issues too is the whole supply chain. They're waiting for boxes. They're waiting for bands. There's a shortage of filler tobacco. Who would have ever thought that would happen? Um, so all these issues that end up happening, they have their reasons too, but they need to get smart too and figure out what they're going to do. Because I see them, they're, they're, regular selling hardcore bread and butter brand is out of stock and they're producing something new or limited releases and things like that. They better concentrate on, on their regular stuff uh, or else that customer is going to go away and they're going to be smoking something different. That's all. And they lose their shelf space and it's mm. not dead back. You know, yep. our humors don't, we, we never have an empty spot on our shelf and we're not going to let an empty box sit there. So they end up losing their shelf space over time. It's just a natural thing to do. I've seen all you guys, um, and Jeff, I'll, I'll get your comment in a second, but I've seen all you guys, like with your customer service, you know, you, you, do, you do take a hands-on approach. Uh, your staff does that. Um, so, and, and I think that's a very, like I see other stores where I am, and I'm not, that they don't do that. Some do that here, but some don't where, it's just like, and I, I noticed because my son worked in a shop <laughs> and it's like, you know, they're not hand selling the product. And I think that's very important if something is not in stock that you could point to someone else saying, hey, 
you may want to give this a try or something like that. And uh, I think that's very important with all you guys do with that. So um, I know that's a good job that you guys done. I think that's very important. It's customer service. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not just selling, it's customer service. And I believe that the customer uh, wants to help or to be at least shown yeah. the new product. They deserve to be shown the new product coming in, at least yeah. be shown, right? And, and somebody may look like they can't afford that cigar or anything. And I say, you know, how disgraceful that a guy comes in and you know that this would be the right product for him, he likes this taste profile and you don't show him because you are selling out of your wallet or you don't think the guy has it. And you say, you know, not this time, but sometime I want to show you, show you this anyway. And, you know, I, I would say eight out of 10 times, the guy's going to give it a try. Yep. How about you, Jeff? How is this? Well, effect, how have you, what have you said? I, on this? So I'm a bit of a prepper. Uh, I've, Everything's going on now was already predicted and written about ahead of time. Uh, there's a guy named Klaus Schwab, uh, World Economic Forum, the Great Reset. That's upon us right now. Um, so everything that's going on right now, uh, we knew about was going to happen. And so the, the problem is you can only prepare for the shortages as much cash as you have. So what I mean by that is that we knew that these, these, these shortages were going to happen. So for the last, I don't know, nine months, we've been preparing for that. So, and I, and I suggest everybody does this too. And on little things, not just cigars, but like Abe mentioned straws or napkins, you know, last year was the great toilet paper rush. But what people <laughs> weren't looking at was, was other things. Um, just give you an example, like a toner for your printers. You should have a six month supply of that. Uh, if there's anything that, that you need for your business, um, because the shutdowns, they're, they're trying as hard as they can right now to shut the global economy down again. Uh, again, it's all by design and, and, and it's not going to end. So you have to prepare for that. And, they, and there's, there's a lot of, of economic force that the World Health Organization can put on developing countries because they, they, they send them so much money. So it's like, well, if you don't lock down, you know, we're not going to give you that that World Health Organization big money that we use to support your government. So um, we know that we knew that these shortages were going to happen in Nicaragua. We knew they were going to happen in the Dominican Republic. We knew they're going to happen in Honduras. So we now have been preparing that with with the cigars, but with everything. So uh, same thing with the liquor. We, we knew all that. So um, and again, they, they're not going to talk about that stuff on CNN. You've got to start broadening and start. The more they tell you not to listen to whoever that is talking, whoever they're trying to, to cancel, that's the people you should probably listen to. Um, so, in, in, so we've, we, I would suggest everybody just, you know, anything you need for, to, for six months, have a supply of it. And then as you, you know, this just in time inventory world that we live in, that doesn't exist right now. Um, and you need to start thinking the way, let me give you a good example. If you live in, let's say, in a small town in Nicaragua, they don't have a Walgreens and a CVS and a Publix and, their, and a Home Depot and a Lowe's right there in their, in their town. We are so used to be able to going to the corner store and getting whatever we want and whatever we need, and it's there. There's so many places that you have to start thinking that, well, you know, that might not be there. So you got to make sure you've got different alternatives for this kind of stuff. So, so um that's that's what we've been doing and uh uh i that's why we haven't run out of there's still some shortages of stuff for sure but we've been loading up on on a lot of stuff and i suggest everybody does jeff mm -hmm. i remember you you saying to me years ago you're a conspiracy guy you're 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 all of you thinking these conspiracy theories and blah 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 until a couple of them come true and you've come full circle welcome my brother Welcome yes. to the real world, right? Yes, David. Dave was the king of conspiracies. And you know what? You know what the difference is between a conspiracy theory and a conspiracy truth? Six months. Yeah. You know, it just becomes education of the past. You've seen it before. And here it is again. As we get older, this is what ends up happening. We've lived through it. The lucky thing that happened for me is I, I saw it in the 90s and I lived through it. So I almost can, can see through the crystal ball how this is going to play out. 
And, you know, maybe it won't, I don't know, but it, it, as luck would have it so far, so good. So I can be prepared for it. And, uh, you know, I, I say this on my own show and I say it to all retailers or whatever, because when, when this first started out, the phone's ringing and they're saying, Dave, what do you do about this? And I said, wow, a pandemic. I don't know. I never went through this before, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to need to buy product. And that was early on. And they'd say, well, buy product. I, I, I don't think I should buy anything. I said, if you got the money to buy the product, buy the, buy the product. If you don't have the money, borrow it, because at the end of it, you're going to need product. Yeah. And at the rate of inflation right now, the interest rate is lower than rate of inflation. Mm. That's the other thing that people aren't realizing. So there's so much stuff. Out, you just got to, you've got to, you got to turn off the, the propaganda out there and just use your own head and see through it. And a lot of people are. Another thing we're not talking about, I mean, what did you expect to happen to the cigar producing countries like Nicaragua and Honduras when you have 2 million people that have crossed the border already this year? You have a mass migration. These are people that, that were working in those cigar factories, people right. that were working on those farms. So it's just common sense. You, you know, you've got, you've got a, a, a real, you know, people getting sick from COVID and then you have a real mass migration. And, you know, so you can tell it's not it, it's not hard to tell that there's going to be shortages. And so you've got to prepare for that. And so um, now, it, you know, it's, it, I don't know if it's too late, but whatever. You just got to just, you know, just in time inventory won't work right now. Um, I'm on mute. I'm off mute. Okay. Uh, Oops in shock is what it is. Oops, like, <laughs> what is going on here? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, one thing I guess just everyone just kind of keep an eye on. I don't know if you guys heard. There was a major election change in Honduras. Um, and there's a new government going in there right now. And that's, I think that's something really worth watching, how that's going to affect things. Um, for sure. It's a, it's a very think- different government that's gone in there right now. So. Gabby Caffey would probably have the best lie on that. I mean, yeah. line on that. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what's going on in Honduras, yeah. but he's always pretty. I'm sure. He's, yeah. You know, you, and that's what I'm saying. Know your sources too. There are guys in this cigar industry that know what's going on in certain areas. Yeah. I'll tell you right now. I, you know, all the people I have on Facebook, there's certain guys I look at when they say stuff, I read it and I read the comments and I, cause I know there's certain guys that know what's going on in the, you know, if they live in Honduras and they see what's going on, they know it. Or if there's guys that work in IT and know about cybersecurity and know about these uh, ransomware attacks and pipelines getting shut down and all that other stuff we saw, I read their stuff and they, they can tell you what's happening. So if that, that's the good part about having a, a big network of folks on, 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 you know, social media that are in the cigar world, a lot of these guys are experts in their, they are, they're experts in their fields. So you, you know, you know, who says, and, and, and can tell you what's going on and, and you'll, you can pay attention and see what's happening. Very true. Very true. David, I want to turn this one to you right now um, because I heard you say this and you were one of the first people I heard say this, and this is regarding the supply and demand thing. And, and this is more on the supply end and correct me if I'm not saying this right, but you actually said this year for the first time, you're starting to see some quality issues with the cigars coming in. Oh, absolutely. So back, back, back again, it seems like 1996, 1997, again, when the cigars start coming in, uh, that um, they have ammonia taste to them because they made them and they shipped them out. They didn't let them rest. They're sick when they, when they arrived to us. Um, there is uh, burn problems that cigar, the tobacco wasn't cured long enough. You can see all these little steps from, I don't want to say the majority of them, but a lot of different manufacturers, some of which, honestly, I'm surprised at. Um, and when this happened the last time, it, there was certainly a changing of the gods that happened uh, during the cigar boom that uh, the people that rushed the product out and the product wasn't that good when availability became good they said okay uh i want brand x instead of what i what i've spoken because it's available one of the good examples of that would be fuente they had come out and said we'll never rush the hands of time during the cigar boom this was it and retailers like me were yelling and screaming and said send me cigars i took many trips down to dominican republic uh to see carlito and his dad and said you know look at all these cigars just ship them and he says well they need eight more weeks and i said 
What's the difference? Eight weeks. He says, I know I could let him out two weeks early, but then the next batch will be four weeks early. And, and this is it. And at the end of it, they were the shining star at the end of the cigar boom uh, because they didn't do it. So um, I, as a capitalist myself, I understand that, that, you know, we, we're all here to make money and, and build our business and stuff, but that's a short term, sell a few extra cigars, short term, long term, it's a big mistake. And uh, listen, you, you're, you're a, a, you, you rate and review cigars, Coop. Um, there's no way that the, the rating system can be as high as it was this year as it was the past years. Uh, it just isn't true. On, on some of these cigars that are coming out. And I don't know if anybody ever comes out with that kind of analogy to say, um, you know, they're, they're not as good as they were. This wasn't the best year for premium cigars is what I'll say. Yeah, we're seeing that for sure. Uh, again, Aaron, Aaron and I have definitely been seeing that um, 2021 for sure. So, so hold on. Let me ask you something because I, I haven't really, as far as like during the, during the boom, man, there was green tobacco going out the door all the time. Like Dave was talking about the ammonia and everything else and just, just bitter tobacco, not good stuff. Right. Cause they were literally growing tobacco, curing it and rolling cigars. Um, I I've seen some construction problems, yep. but I haven't yep. tasted bad tobacco in the good brands, the trusted brands. Um, but, and I understand construction problems because like I said, uh, 20% of the country, they've lost 20% of their population because of migration. Um, so, you know, you got guys that used to be rolled, you got to come up with new rollers, you know, to replace the ones that are leaving. So I can see the construction problems, but, um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not smoking the same cigars that are, but I, I haven't tasted the, the, cause man, during the boom, there were some really bad tobacco. I mean, some horrible tasting cigars. Well, that, that was because uh, the boom, the boom lasted seven years. So far, this boom is two years old, so it'll get yeah. worse and worse if, if the boom continues, uh, which personally, I don't think will. I hope I'm wrong on that one for sure, but it's only been a couple of years, but you can see that I can see the drop off of the, these things myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if Coop's saying the same thing, I mean, it's I don't want it to be. And I, I've even said it. To some of the manufacturers, geez, your stuff's coming in green. Well, you know, the, the we had a little problem with the binder. Oh, we had this. We had that. They were, they were a little, let them dry out a little bit. They were a little wet when they did it. Ugh, you know, the next thing you know, it's going to be like Cuba. You know, yep. we'll put them out and they're going to accept them the way they are. Yeah, you're going to accept them the way they are right now, but they're going to brand switch um, like I was saying, with um, the, a shortage, the brand isn't there. They're going to switch to something else. It may never go back to those brands. So it's it's a mistake. I, I'm I'm yelling for cigars. Believe me, I'm asking for more and more cigars, but not if they're not ready. Don't send them to me if they're ready. Not ready. If they are ready, I want my fair share of what what's coming in that's ready. Yeah, I, I do think that in the next year. In the year after that, we're going to start seeing some tobacco that's just not as not as good, and not because of the plant or the leaves themselves, but just because of the time it takes to properly ferment. And, and you know, you cure it in the barn, but the fermentation and the aging—that's where a lot of time is spent. And so, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have some problems. Well, they're, they're rolling faster. They're, yeah. You know, typically a pair of rollers does 300 cigars a pair. Let's say that for a number. And they're saying to them, well, we'll give you a bonus if you do 350. Or instead of uh, an eight-hour day, we're going to keep you guys on for 10 hours. You can't imagine, you know, you don't want the cigar, like we say, on the Monday morning cigar roller, because uh, he was drunk all weekend. And you don't want the guy after 10 hours of those cigars. But they're mixed in with it, yeah. too. So yeah. uh, as you're rushing these guys, quality control changes. The same thing with the fermenting pile that okay is is it done well it could use a little more it's good enough you know and these little corners that are that are cut along the way uh i'm starting to taste it yeah how about you abe what have you seen with this quality issues no it's there i mean look it's not it's not just there in in the country, man it's everywhere you know i mean it's 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 the current world we live in when, when, what, what universe did you think you could call somewhere and a 45-minute hold was normal now? I mean, when, when would that be? Someone? I wish my patrons would allow me to put them on hold for 45 minutes. I mean, it, it's, it is nuts. 
We went down to the, the, the cigar snob. Look, and, and some people are just taking advantage of what people are now willing to accept, whether it's the quality of a cigar, whether it's service. We went down to um, Cigar Snob's anniversary here in Miami, and my wife and I stayed at the Hard Rock. They had Guns N' Roses there. Uh, place was packed. I mean, they had a couple big shows there. Place was packed, body to body, all over the place. But then when you went to your room, there was a seal on the door, unbroken, saying that for our protection, no one was going to clean our room for the three days we were there. For our protection. Yes. The maid who comes when we're not there and cleans the room wasn't going to come. But meanwhile, we're walking. So, you know, it, it's a struggle. I and mean, I, I don't think a lot of these manufacturers or anybody who are is having quality issues, obviously none of them, I don't think, are intentionally doing it. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing what they can and w- with what they can. But I think this is just whether it's service or product, um, it's, it's just a byproduct of, of coming, you know, of what's going on in the world. And I'm, I'm an opportunist. I, I look at that as an opportunity and I tell my staff that, that, uh, you know, just to go get a cup of coffee in the morning, the line is 20 minutes long and just to, it's every, everything's crazy like this. And I said, OK, this is our chance to shine. We can really be noticed if we give ultimate customer service. And I thought we always did, but you can always boost it up a little bit. I said, let's just show them all the more and just see how many people end up recognizing, holy God, you guys are great. And it's true, they end up, they end up saying it and say, you, you got the best staff out there. I hear it so much from my, my uh, customers that come up to me and say, this guy, that guy is something. And it's great to hear, but it, it's an opportune time. If you work at a cigar store, if somebody's listening here and you work at a cigar store, step it up a little bit and you are going to shine like a, a shining light. Everyone's going to notice because it's so bad out there. So you can look like a rock star uh, by just turning it up just a little bit. And uh, there's the opportunity. Yep. Abe, kind of along those lines, I want to kind of turn it to product innovation right now. How have you seen product innovation uh, this year? Um, there's some very exciting things that came out this year. Um, and I, I'll tell you the, the, the thing that I've seen uh, maybe, maybe even start pre-COVID, but more post-COVID is um, a lot of the bigger companies who just kind of didn't really get involved in these kind of you know specialty projects and stuff like that. A lot more involvement on it, uh, I think, in the last couple of years. And I think during COVID, a lot of companies who really didn't interact or get uh, have made themselves more available, uh, especially for guys like me and you, Coop. I mean, everybody was doing shows. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, you know, and Dave, too, sorry. Um, everybody all of a sudden became more available. So, um, yeah. How about you, Jeff? I th- I think there's been some really good product innovation this year. And I'll give you perfect examples. I thought the Davidoff Year of the Tiger was really slick. It that, was, that, yeah. was a, that was a great, great new product. Um, these new Fuente humidors, uh, incredible. That purple rain when it comes out, man, that thing looks sweet. So a lot of this, you know, the ST DuPont stuff, I don't know if you saw those over. X, yeah, right there. Yep, it's awesome. Yep, that that yep, Tiger. Tiger, yep. And the, um, the, those Opus X scissors and stuff. There are some, there was some really slick, uh, innovative products. Um, I know Atabay and Byron had a really beautiful, innovative product for Corona cigar. Uh, that turned out amazing. So, uh, so I've seen some th- this year, there was some really cool stuff. Uh, um, but again, there's, there's, you know, uh, I know ST DuPont's a little out of a lot of stuff and I don't think that's going to get any better, but, um, all in all, we saw some really, really slick stuff and, and Drew Estate's got some cool stuff coming out too. So, you know, considering COVID, we've got some, we've had some really cool things come out uh, this year that are top quality. And um, the one thing that, this is funny, the, when I was at the trade show this summer, I thought the, the advent cal- calendar was brilliant. Um, unfortunately, the Tatuahe one didn't make it. Uh, uh, and I know Abe was working on a ridiculously cool one. And then the one that uh, showed up, uh, I was a little disappointed in because yeah. it didn't have any, it had no holiday stuff on it. So I'm like, so that was a missed opportunity. Uh, 
we load it in, but the good part for them is there's no other competition for the advent calendar. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, like I said, the Tatuaje one I thought was slick and, uh, and Abe's one that, that maybe he'll turn it into an Easter advent calendar, but, uh, that one was badass too. So I think next year you're going to see some good advent calendars. Yeah. I saw the, I was in Abe's office and I saw the box and Abe's like, you haven't seen the box before. I said, Abe, when you see that thing in person, it's, it's mind boggling. It was just that amazing. So um, I totally get what he was doing with that. It was yeah, very impressive, that box, that packaging. How about you, Dave? Innovation wise, I think it's across the board so far. People have been pretty positive on that. Yeah, this this was the chance to be innovative. If you, you had a couple of years uh, and it, it's the time to start thinking and figuring out different ways around different product, different things. And packaging has to be a big part of it, especially if a lot of these things were coming in from China and these boats are off the coast and we have issues with that country anyway. Who knows what the future holds? So it's going to be different packaging and different things like that. Take the cigar out of it. But um, as far as the packaging goes, innovation, ab- absolutely. And these guys were sitting home getting creative and coming up with ideas, and uh, they killed it. Yeah, I mean, true. It's true. I mean, we've talked a lot about that, like these types of – I mean, Saka, pipe tobacco release. I don't think anyone saw that coming at the beginning of the year. So we've gotten some different things uh, for sure, I think, with that. All right. So what I want to do, guys, I'm going to do a, a couple of commercial reads. If you guys need to stretch or whatever, uh, then we can get right back into it. Um, we'll move forward. Sound good? Good. All right. I'm, I'm going to need another cigar, right? For sure. Yeah, oh, you're yeah. Gonna, yeah, you're going to need another cigar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't expect anything less. Okay. Um, all right. I want to mention um, Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley. Visit alecbradley.com to find out more about their cigars. Live true. And I'm going to mention Corona Cigar Company. At Corona Cigar Company, we take pride in the fact that we are cigar fanatics just like you. That's why you will find the best selection of the rarest and finest premium cigars available anywhere in the world. Plus, we have special limited edition cigars available exclusively to Corona Cigar Company from famous international cigar makers like Avo, LFD, Drew Estate, Perdomo, Gurkha, and Oliva. Corona Cigar Company, the best cigar selection, the best customer service, and money-saving discount prices. But don't just take our word for it. Forbes magazine selected Corona Cigar Company as the best of the web. Corona Cigar Company was voted top five internet cigar retailer by Smoke Magazine. Cigar Aficionado wrote Corona Cigar Company, the largest, best cigar shop in America. Place an order online at coronacigarcompany.com or visit one of Corona's four central Florida cigar superstores and cigar bars and see for yourself why Corona Cigar Company is the ultimate cigar experience. And by A.J. Fernandez Cigars. A.J. Fernandez's New World brand is named in the honor of the discovery of tobacco by Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. Fernandez collaborated with his father, Ishmael, on a cigar which is comprised of a wrapper from Nicaragua, and it covers a binder from the Jalapa Valley and a filler blend of Ometepe, Condega, and Esli tobaccos. The core line debuted in 2014, and it was followed by the New World Connecticut, the New World Pura Special, and the New World Cameroon. All four blends are able to captivate the palate of any cigar smoker. If you're beginning to discover the world of fine premium handmade cigars, the New World Connecticut's for you. If you're into rich full body blends, Puro Specials for you. And if you're into complex flavors, the New World Cameroon's for you. Finally, if you're into robust and earthy flavors with notes of espresso, the New World is definitely for you. Visit www.ajfcigars.com to learn more. All right, guys, uh, we're waiting on David here for a second. Um, but um, uh, and Abe, so we kind of lost them both. So hey, Jeff, you mind? I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a couple more reads in the meantime. If you okay for that. Yep, just go so, for it. Yeah, just so we don't uh, break things up. And all of our deliberation segments tonight are sponsored by Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. There is no deliberation when it comes to Dumbarton's track records since launching in 2015. This has included six consecutive top three appearances on the half wheel consensus, including number one cigar of the year in 2020 with the Mi Carita Tricky Traca. You can visit ttccigars.com to find a curveyor that carries the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. And um, I will mention, um, of course, United Cigars. Um, we do the United Cigars One Must Go segment. We're going to do that on Tuesday um, because I want to get to some other things. But I want to mention United Cigars uh, featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron. Buy United, smoke United, 
Live United. All right. So uh, we, we're waiting on A, but I'm going to kind of get things started right now. Um, uh, as far as I want to get into trade shows right now, I think everyone's favorite topic. Um, and I know all of you were at the trade show this year. Um, and Abe, we're just kind of getting into trade shows here. Um, and all three of you returned to the trade show. I don't want to say returned. Not all returned, but all three of you were at the trade show this year. Um, and I just want to kind of get some general thoughts on the trade show. And then I have some specific questions um, for you guys. On the, and I'm talking the PCA trade show this year. Um, and Dave, we'll start this one off with you. PCA trade show. I know you didn't exhibit there this year, but we, I know you were at the trade show and you, we ran into each other. I know you were working the floor impressions of the trade show overall this year. Uh, well, it was down two thirds of the size. It was kind of shocking walking in, um, boy, talk about bringing you back into the late eighties. I mean, that's what it looked like then, uh, before the cigar boom and there it was again. Uh, but I thought it was important for me to show up, uh, showing, you know, we're, we're all together and united and, um, I, I needed to go, uh, for, for that reason. Um, the problem is with, with not just that trade show, but all trade shows is, um, they're not so needed anymore. As a matter of fact, I, I hired a, a graphic designer to do a project for me. And the guy is a graphic designer for trade show booths and things like that. That's what he does. And I asked him a lot of questions about trade shows, uh, about all of them. And they're all down. So trade shows are down because we're in a different world here. We are zooming from, from, uh, four different states right now and these things can be done virtually um and you know i would imagine with the with the three guests you have here um we can all get the trade show deal no matter what probably we don't have to be there but um what i always loved about the trade show is getting together with people like this uh i you know you, you had said um Jeff and Abe and Dave getting together. Uh, I remember the last time we did, which was at a, um, a TAA, we were all together. Um, we ended up at the same place sitting by the pool or something one afternoon and talking about um, um, theft, uh, in, in the, which your wife was unbelievable, the stories. Uh, and this is, the, you know, if there's something that I get out of a trade show, that is it, that you can't get those kind of conversations because we all live the same life, you know, e even though they're, they're 1500 miles away from me, we're in the same exact business and to sit down there is invaluable. There's, there's nothing better than it. So screw the deal, screw, screw the trade show as the trade show it is. I don't need to see another one, but I do need to get together with these guys again. And that's the perfect opportunity to do it. Um, the trade show has to change. It can't be the same way it is. I know people don't like change, but you know, it's, you know, people didn't want to change from typewriters to computers either. You have to do it. And you're just going to die uh, with it. So what, what do, do I want to see in a trade show? I want education. I want, I want to grow my education and learn more. It's the whole reason why I put United Cigar together in the first place. It was what was missing at the trade show. I sat on that board for eight years. Um, I did four years, took one year off, asked to be put back on. I did another four years. Uh, brutal brutal because uh, most of the things that I wanted to ac accomplish there uh, as a self-employed person, I usually get my way. I was, I didn't get my way at all. Uh, so I ended up forming a company to try to do exactly that, which is help educate the retailer so that we can survive. Uh, because at the end of it, uh, I don't want to be the dinosaur, the last guy standing, or it's odd to go into a cigar shop to buy a cigar. Would you buy cigars in a cigar shop? That's weird. You know, I didn't want that to end up happening. Um, so education needs to be a big part of it. You know, listen, you, Coop, you, you do a podcast. You need to be informative and entertaining. You have to do both. Yep. And those are the two things that the trade show needs. They need information, informative, and entertainment, along with there's a trade show there. And those are the two things that they're missing. And they, they have done it before a little bit and had a little concert, had this. But, look, look, you know, what Abe did 
should have been the trade show. I mean, that would have been the highlight of the trade show, having an eight hour live show from the trade show or something like that. Um, you know, the, the different events that happen from in stores and things like that. There's so much that could be done. But listen, I, I've beaten that horse to the ground um, with with those people, even during COVID that we had, Jeff, I believe uh, me and you were in a, in a meeting with um, PCA, um, a Zoom call or something during there to say, what can we do? What can we do? Um, they, they hear it, but the powers that be, and, and, and it's not Scott who, who takes orders from the board of directors, but it's board of directors that are there and i love all those guys man i i know them all but they have old ways of doing things and they don't want change and listen i'm, I'm an old guy but i know change is necessary and that's the battle i think that's going on this is the way we always did it well that's the way it cannot survive anymore and uh if they plan on doing the trade show next year the same way it'll be a little less and if they do it the next year it'll be a less, little less until it, until it so a major change overhaul to happen and then uh maybe it gets worse before it gets better you know uh you know that's something that ends up happening too it's a higher ticket item or something like that and then watch it soar but somebody has to figure out something there and i don't i don't see those changes happening i'm gonna abe i'm gonna hold you for last on this one uh because i know you have a lot to say on this but i want to go to jeff first this is such a, a tough subject because it's not just the PCA that runs into this. There's, there's other trade associations I'm, I'm in and membership is something they're always talking about. Um, you know what? I enjoyed the last trade show, but I think I enjoyed it more because I, it's been a long time since I was able to just walk the floor at like my own pace. And it, and it was a little more relaxing and having time to catch up with people and talk. However, Business-wise, it definitely, you know, I certainly miss the big guys being not, you know, I wish they were there. Um, and I, and I really do, it's, you know, Dave, we talk about it, what it used to be and what it is now and stuff. But, you know, I, I look back at the things I remember that I really liked, you know, I, I like those, those uh, dinners that uh, General Cigar did when, um, you know, they would have the owners of the company there and, uh, you got to talk about that when Marvin Samuel at Drew Estate would do his little Maggiano dinners. And uh, <clears throat> when, uh, you know, Davidoff was doing their awesome uh, um, mm. parties and, and, uh, and their awards and stuff. I do miss that stuff. But at the same time, it was nice being able to walk the show and, and, and be able to see things and, and catch a few things that you used to miss. Um, I, when it comes to education, I really feel the same way David does. But when I talk about education, um, I want to see guys like, uh, you know, Grant Cardone. I want to see Gary Vandercheck. I want to see guys that are like top of the, of the, of the, of their game and stuff. Um, you know, when they had John Taffer there, I thought that was amazing. Cause I've always, I've been to his seminars before in the bar industry. So, um, but you, you really need guys that are really at the top. Um, and, and I, I don't think they probably can't afford those guys because these are the people that, that big trade shows and big, you know, Fortune 500 companies are hired to, to come speak at. So um, it, I think this is a much tougher thing to solve because they've definitely laid out the problems um, and the company saved tons of money by not going. Um, but uh, there, there's also some, some things they lose by not being there, that's for sure. And it gives an opportunity for, let me give you a good example, like uh, El Septimo. He, they ended up being the star of the show for the leg, luxury section because, you know, Davidoff wasn't there. And so I wish Davidoff was there. And, I, and, and again, I, I thought the award ceremonies they did were fantastic. So there's different things that can open up um, when these big guys aren't there. So hopefully they'll look at that and say, you know, maybe we should be there. Um, I think one of those four will be back next year. That's my personal opinion. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, either way, I, I will say this. Listen, we're all really sharp retailers, and we have to look at what, what's in, available and what's there. Trade show or not, you know, uh, two guys and smoking and a Corona cigar are going to su succeed. 
our business is we're going to plow forward. We're going to make it happen. We're going to sell cigars. Um, so yeah, it's a lot more fun and the industry is more fun when we had those things, you know, and you had Osgeners and family companies and, you know, having big bands and stuff. And, and I, and I, and that's one of the things that attracted a lot of people. And that is what makes the cigar industry different than others is that there's, uh, you know, the family owned companies there and family owned companies obviously can operate, uh, differently than, you know, your multinational corporations that, that have a lot of different, um, you know, parameters or rules that they've got to uh, uh, go through. So, you know, if, if you're an owner of a company and decide, Hey, you know, I want to have, let's say whatever name a band and you want to spend a ton of money on it. And even though you're not, no, you're not going to get your ROI on that, but still you're like, man, maybe they like parties and they like music, you know, so that's worth it for them. So um, I look forward to these trade shows. This is a tough thing to solve though. Honestly, if I was on the board of directors of, of PCA right now, I'm not, I, I don't think I could solve this problem either. Um, but I, I really don't know uh, what the future holds, but I will say this. It's incredibly important that we have the trade association because for me, what I look at is the lobbying side. If we don't have the funding to run the lobbyists and, and have a presence in Washington, which is what we have, you know, the, the PCA has made some good moves since over the last 15 years, the fact that they have, you know, remember they were in Columbus, Georgia. There was no reason yeah. for the, it, that was ridiculous. Now they're in Washington, DC. They have a presence there. There's, there's adv advocacy that's going on and that is the key. So big picture, it's important to support it. Uh, uh, it could it be better, of course, um, but it's, it's, I don't think it's an easy problem to solve. And like Dave said, most of these trade association are ever having a problem with trade shows. But it's, it's, I hope, it, I know it'll continue, but will it get better? I don't know. Will it get smaller? Maybe. But either way, I'll still be there. Good. Now, Abe, you, uh, you've you been pretty vocal on this. Um, I know you and I have had a lot of conversations on this. What do you want to add on that? <laughs> I, really can't, I really can't add much after Jeff and Dave. I mean, they kind of hit all the points. I mean, look. I had made it, I, I haven't gone in years. And it wasn't anything other than just, just a timely thing. You know, I have young children. They got to the ages of, hey man, what are we doing this summer? Spend time with the family. They have a short window of time in the summer. So for me, the time of year to get up and leave for five days, it just didn't work out. And it wasn't, it, going to the show for me as a company and, and all these guys, I think, I think I had Dave on KMA once talking yep. about, you know, it's not really relevant. It's not necessary. We don't need to go. Um, but I had made a decision to go the year it, it was canceled for COVID, just like Dave said, out of solidarity, you know, I wanted to show. And then obviously it didn't happen. And then I, we went this year. And it was disheartening to see. And I, you know, I, you know, I, I would have really hoped in that period of having that much time off where you really, you know, there, there was, there was, in my opinion, because I could only say what would I do if I was in that situation, but there, there was a period of time there where not having the trade show uh, during the pandemic could have worked in their favor. They could have taken advantage of that time of having really thought, okay, you know, we, four of our biggest companies have left this year. All right, it was going to be a, a really awkward show. Now it's not happening. Now we got all this time to plan. How do we come back with a show that says, "Look at this," you know, we, you know, we made a turn or whatever. And I just don't think they did that. And you know, I, you know, none of us have been on the board now for a while, so we don't know the ins and outs of of the decision making process. But you know, I've just always been a believer that there's always a way. You know, you, you know, when I, you know, there are times in my organization, I don't know the answer. I call my top three, four, five guys in a room. We, and that's what we did for the great smoke in 2020. We had seen, we had seen in 2021, the earlier this year, we had seen a couple other companies attend, uh, attempt virtual events. We said, we definitely don't want to do it like that. <laughs> and um, we knew it wasn't going to happen live. We didn't want to do it that way. And we really didn't want to not have it after 15 years, you know? 
And we literally were, we were, it was probably a good two and a half hours, three hours coming up with ideas, what we could do, what we could do this. Where, and that's literally the words I said is like, you know, man, be cool. We could do like this Jerry telethon. Can we see like really cool? Thing. I mean, at one point my plan, and we just didn't have time to make it happen. We were going to have like a dummy dialer station to make Steve Saka answer phones, act like he's taking orders for people calling. You know, we had, to, we had a lot of crazy stuff that went on the wall that never made it to the final project, but um you got to think tank it. You bring your top minds in and you think tank it. And there's a way they can make a better, much better show. But when you have it being run by people who really aren't vested, they don't get paid for their time. They're all volunteers. They're all running their own companies. They're all got their own problems and day in and day out of their businesses. Who, who's going to make that happen? Because I'll tell you what, you know, we start working around the great smoke, like literally <laughs> the same month it's over. You know, we already know our plan for 2023 and the theme for 2023. Forget 2022. So who's going to do that? So it, it, they're not situated to solve the problem. That's what it is. You know, I, 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 first off, I don't think really the most innovative people in the industry have been on the board for the longest time. You know, we shared a story with everybody earlier today, you know, in the beginning of the show, and the three of us were basically like against everybody on the board. Um but when you have an organization that's run by volunteers and, and most of them are kind of self pick themselves most of the time. So you're seeing basically the same group of 10 people over the course of a decade plus, you know, basically making decisions for the organization and it's not their livelihood. It's not what they do. So they're not, I don't even think they're in a position to, to, to try to really fix the problem or make it happen. But I like it. It was fun for me to go this year, even though I really kind of had to work it because I was handling it while my operations guy would handle all the other stuff. I was really handling all the stuff for the warehouse. So I was like, like once again, like 15 years ago, running around everybody trying to figure everything out. But um, it, it, it's very cathartic and it's very fun to go and see our friends. And, you know, Steve, Jeff and I had a great dinner with our families uh, one night. It, it, you know, we live two hours away, three hours away, and we don't get to do that very often. I think we have either I've gone up to Orlando, he's come over here maybe three times in 20 years, but we go to Vegas, we'll, we'll find a way to get together. And we have a good time. So that part of it is always great for us. But I mean, they, they, I, I, I don't, like Jeff said, it's a hard problem. And not only is it a hard problem, I just don't think they have the way it's structured. It, it it's even feasible to work on it. Because to do something like Dave's talking about, like we do, it's a lot of work. That's a job. <laughs> That's like a full-time job putting on a production like that, you know? And um, I, I just don't know how that gets fixed. I really don't. You know, the only way it gets fixed, you bring somebody, that's their job. They're the event planner. They make it happen. You give them a salary, you give them a budget, and you let one person run with it. But this committee thing, you know, we will all tell you, man, it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. No decisions ever get made. Nope. I agree. I have been through that myself. There's a lot of things that we could talk about with the trade show, but I'm gonna, I'm just going to pick one thing right now that kind of stuck out to me. Now, and I'll give you my opinion of it, and you guys could agree with me or disagree with me. There was this whole notion of economy of scale. And the scale, you, I know Dave, you mentioned kind of these booze were a throwback. Um, you know, and I'm talking a lot of the booze was smaller that wasn't so much a problem as some of the booze were just like terrible right i didn't think this was a good look for our industry i understand there were special circumstances in 2021 with the but i'm hoping we don't see this in 2022 and i'm not saying we have to go back to the extravagant booze either but i'm hoping there's some happy medium to kind of present these premium products here so um, some of them, some of them were disrespectful, to be honest with you. Yeah. That, OK. It's not just me thinking that. OK. Yeah. Uh, D don't even show up. I mean, it, almost a sign of an, an FU at that point of uh, if this is all you're going to do. Uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't be allowed. I mean, to that bad. You don't even have the decency to put a uh, tablecloth, you know, I mean, really crazy uh, stuff that was there. Unmanned boots. Empty, you know, booths unmanned. Aaron um, had to fill in at a booth. Aaron had to fill it in a booth. Yeah. <laughs> there was one guy who had lounge furniture set up, 
and he had signs on the chair. You know, no one manned the booth the whole show. He came, set it up, they left. Wow. Yeah, there was a plastic laminated sign. I don't know if you guys saw it. It's a nice furniture, but it had a plastic laminated sign for information, email me here, call me here, whatever, and that was it. Yeah. Crazy. But but listen, guys, here's a, here's the thing though. It, you got that's just an opportunity for others. That's the beauty of the of the cigar business, and that's the beauty of not having the FDA, you know, with all those crazy regulations that makes it impossible to enter this business. I've always said the barriers to entry are pretty low, and so when people, you know, do those things like just leaving chairs and no one there, well, that's why Steve Saka had you know fifty people waiting in line to see him, and that's why other guys there were working their booths. It gave them an opportunity to to excel. So um, some people will see the opportunity, and others will squander it. So, but I, it, yeah, it's disrespectful and is what it is. But um, I don't read too too much into it, other than uh, you know, some people make good decisions and some don't. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It was like I said, I can't say Steve's booze for like an economy booze was one of the best ones. He'll tell you that wasn't a you know. What he puts in that booth, I care, I care stuff, and I thought he—it's a great booth he did. So, um, okay, all right, let's move on. Um, I got okay. This is a non-cigar question. I'm going to ask everybody, Jeff. This is just for you, man. This is our cattle baron steak question of the night. All right, <laughs> all right. So this is just for you. And I'm going to give you the first shot at this one. All right, we're not talking a Beyond Meat here. We're talking a nice, big, thick, juicy steak. What topping, if any, do you like on your steak? Mm. So yesterday, I happened to have a nice steak dinner at Capitol Grill, and they had a uh, they had a coffee rub um, that was actually I've had that before. So yes. so it depends on on I I like my steak seasoned. Um, that's why we have we have FSG steak seasoning that we do, and there's. So I, I think seasoning complements uh, complements beef for sure, um, but other than 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 some good seasoning, I'm not big about you know if, if you put shrimp or if you put the uh, the crab, I kind of you know pull that off to the side so you have like a little surf and turf or something. But right. you know, and, and, and even if you have uh, you know hollandaise sauce or whatever, the way if people like it, that's all that matters. So that's all. So so I, I am not against any toppings on these steak. I'm just totally against. Fake meat, lab-grown meat, um, inkjet printed meat with God knows what. Um, you ever listen, Soylent Green, uh, yeah. that's preparing us, okay? So uh, a lot of stuff that was in the movies 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago is coming true. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be Soylent Green that, that's, that's, you know, made from humans, but uh, who knows what this, this crazy uh, lab-grown uh, or laser. Have you seen the scene with the printer that prints the meat? No. no. Yeah. No. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> there's some crazy stuff going on. Uh, real steak's the way to go. All right. All right. All right, Abe. What do you like on your steak? Um. I mean, if if I put anything on a steak, I've known to I've been known to get a little bit of a blue cheese crust on a steak. You know, or if if it's not that, maybe not a Delmonico or a strip. I'll, I'll do a little apois, but that's pretty much it. What's a pois? It's a a pois. It's, yeah, whatever. I don't know. I mean, I'm not pronouncing it right, but it's it's the peppers. It's like a gravy, bernet pepper sauce. You know, peppercorn sauce. Mm -hmm. I want to call a friend. I want to call Evan Darnell. <laughs> <There you go>. <laughs> <laughs> did I not pronounce it right? Huh? Does you probably did. did. I don't know. I don't know. A, a u p a pois. It's a pois. I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna oh. call. Him. <laughs> well, we well we do the phone a friend here, uh, Dave. What about you? Grilled onions. There, there you go. go. There you go. That's I'm in. Man. I'm in, man. I'm in with that one. <laughs> I love onions. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, hey, hey, Jeff. Just so you know, I, I don't know when I was in Tampa uh, in August. Uh, I drove. I kind of had. I drove straight through from Tampa back home, and I did go to that White Castle. And there was no line. It was like eight was in the morning. Like, but I went eight. Yeah, in the I was morning. gonna say went eight in the morning. morning though, is what I'm so I had White Castle like <laughs> eight in the morning. Just you know, but I, but I did find it. Yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, the white listen white castle is good but i mean yeah. listen it's more of a just a little which i say people missing their taste of, of new york or up north when they when because they can't oh, get yeah. to florida because i uh, i no, agree he's phoning uh, abe's abe's phoning a friend right now abe's little... <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually on it's, on yeah. Yeah. it's, uh, fresh. it's a ground pepper sauce it's made with ground peppercorns <laughs> there, you there you go, go. there you go that's what there you go all right that's official so that was our cow baron state question of the night um, want to talk about some cigar company things. Uh, a couple questions here. Um, for each of you. Name one cigar company in 2021 that you think has been on point, on target, what they've done. Uh, kind of done a great job. And Jeff, we'll start it off with you. That's pretty easy, Steve Saka. Okay. There so, I mean, <laughs> it's, I think anybody who sees what he's doing on his stuff, I mean, they're, uh, it's still, in my opinion, somewhat of a startup company. It very but, much is. Um, but, but again, Steve's working his ass off. The yep. guy's working. He's pulling every lever to make it happen. And, uh, you, know, you know, there's a saying, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And the guy's working really hard and has been working really hard. So uh, I, I think that that's the, that's the biggest one. Now, during the, uh, the 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 shutdowns and stuff, I think Drew Estate for the big companies done the best yeah. as far as uh, they really uh, worked social media well, especially with all their different you know shows and stuff that they've done. I think this Bitcoin thing is uh, is is brilliant. So uh, on the big established companies, I'd say uh, Drew Estate. On the independent up and comers, Steve Saka. There you go, Dave. Uh, well, I'm excited about the next generations of some of these companies. So looking at a, an old company, uh, I like Drew Estate. Um, I, I see uh, what they did with the American Yagua. Um, this Perla Del Mar that they, they relaunched is on fire right now, uh, talking about value brands. Uh, I, th I think they're, they're killing it right now. Um, for, for an old company like that, you know, you bring in Drew Newman and we're starting to see what, what he can add to that company. And he's done a great job. Yeah. I, so you, I mean, meant, I, you meant J.C. Newman, not 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 Drew Estate when you were saying that, Dave. Oh, J.C. Newman. Did I say Drew? I meant Drew yeah. Newman. So, yeah, Drew Newman with uh, uh, J.C. Newman. I'm sorry. OK, good. OK, I, I figured that, too. Abe. I, I literally, as Jeff was talking, I, I have I have the exact same really picks because. I even was saying, I, I, I kind of got to do this kind of like the trade show exhibitor booths, you know, big company, small company, because Drew Estate, without a doubt, attacked it on a, on a social media, especially during all their um, virtual events that they were trying to do with all the retailers and everything. And they, they're just an aggressive company. I mean, Drew Estate is probably, in my opinion, the marketing company of the cigar manufacturing side of the industry, undoubtedly. Um, on, on all pistons they fire, whether it's, you know, consumer engagement, swag, you know, making brands, making products, uh, they, they, they got it really firing on, on all levels. And, you know, I, I, I work very closely with Steve and we do a lot of projects with Steve. And, um, you know, when you do stuff like this, like especially when we did the Great Smoke earlier this year, when you're talking about crazy ideas, it's hard for other people to understand sometimes what you're trying to do. And that's what we're all kind of trying to scurry during COVID, you know, whether it was liquor packages or pop-up stores or, um, you know, virtual side events. And, um, you know, it's so nice. I mean, yeah, he can pull complain and whine about it, but Steve was always on board for stuff like that. And he's reaped the benefits of it uh, this year. So I, I literally, as Jeff was speaking, those were the exact thoughts that were going through my head. Yep. Good job. Good job. Okay. So now this is the question you may want to take the fifth on. Okay. Um, and this is a question I borrowed from my colleague, Dave Burke on the jukebox show. And this is the now or never company for this year a company. Like, like they got to get it done this year or else like they're in trouble. Good question. All right. Abe, I'm going to put that to you first. And like I said, you guys can take the fifth if you want. I'm okay with that. I think it's I gotta, I, 
Yeah, I was just going to say it. I was going to jump in and end up saying that uh, they have a, they have a great opportunity oh, I'm to. Sorry, uh, Dave. I'm sorry, Dave. I, <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. What is it? That's no, no, right. I said A. I said A, but I, I said A, but that's okay. That's that's a good one. You pause, Dave. So Dave took yeah. the opportunity. No, I paused. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking because you know, some of the companies, I think, with, I, I think some of the choices I had, they've already passed that point. But I think with Ferry Otago and with Michael maybe bringing some light, a little bit more light to them this year, um, uh, it's 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 an I think now or never moment for them. They don't find a way to optimize on this exposure um, and build on it. Uh, I I don't know what what'll be left because Michael's putting it out there, you know, and it can hopefully shine some real light on. And Manny's a great guy. You know, I, I've known him for many, many years, been on my show a couple of times. So I, I really hope, I really hope they find a way. I'll say this, because I've smoked the products this year. They came out with the trade show. The products are there. They got good products that came out this year. So now, now it's really, that's, I'm taking the next step with them. You know, but I, I think the products were good. They came out with this year. You've always had good products. Too. Yeah. But they, 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 they kind of, you know, they were kind of um, off the radar for a while. There hadn't been much coming from them for a couple of years. This year, as far as the Casada branded products, um, they, they were really good. But I think, you know, it's a fair answer what you guys had, too. Okay, Jeff. I think this year that, that everybody will probably just make it just because of the shortages. So I don't, I, I'm thinking, who do I think would, isn't going to make it this year? I think they're all going to make it. Um, if it was hyper competitive again, uh, obviously the Casada brands haven't done that great, which I, is kind of weird because Manolo Casada is like he's he's the real deal. He's got you know decades and decades of experience. Right. Um, I think it's just so hard that you've got so many cigar companies that are really good marketing companies. Um, whereas if you're in the Dominican Republic and you're a great cigar maker. It still doesn't make the consumer pick up your brand because um, you don't have the marketing behind it. I mean, look at, like I said, look at look at the stuff that Drew Estate does when it launches a brand. I mean, this is this is really well thought out, planned, deep stuff. And so, uh, as the industry's gotten um, more sophisticated on brand launches and stuff, um, yeah, I think it's a little tougher. But I, I think that still this year, just because of um, you know, we talked earlier, if there's, if the shelf, if the cigars aren't on the shelf, you're going to, as a retailer, we've got to fill that shelf space. So there's, there's opportunity during times like this for, for, for brands to, uh, that wouldn't have made the cut in, in past years, but they're, they're going to get a, a second look. And, and, and a lot of times they, uh, what I call a trial order and get them on the shelf to see what they do. And so there's that opportunity, uh, definitely this year and next year. Um, that wasn't there in the past. Good job. Good job, guys. All right. All right. Let's turn to all of you guys have, have had programs um, in your operations, uh, store exclusives. Um, let me ask the question, why are store exclusives so important to each of your businesses? And Jeff, we'll start this one off with you. Well, for, if you go back from when we first started on our store exclusives, the, the reason for that was to cut out the, the middleman. So when I started traveling in Nicaragua back in the 90s and stuff, it was simply to uh, have those, those name brand cigar factories make cigars for us that are uh, under the Corona brand and go straight from the factory to us, which therefore would allow the customer to get a cigar at a at a, a, a comparable cigar, but at a much lower price. So that's the whole idea behind it, the, like the, the Corona Nicaraguan and Corona Dominican and stuff like that. But then we started shifting with other uh, exclusives that were with uh, existing brands. Mm -hmm. um, so we and, and those would be either exclusive blends or or sizes, things like that. But then um, with my my crazy farming passion, that's where we really started going into the exclusive cigars with our own farm to table concept, if it will, um, with, with our cigar tobacco blended with, uh, you know, tobaccos from these, these well-established and respected factories. So, so that's, that's where most of our focus has been on, but, uh, I've said this before, um, we, 
I, I don't do the um, limited, you know, 500 boxes sold gone type of thing, um, which has been extremely successful for, for Abe, I know. Um, but for us, I, I tend to do more of uh, releasing a brand. I want to keep it going because if it's a great product that I don't like, you know, why stop it? So, so uh, I like to build longer term um, brands and we just, uh, I, I don't know if our customers for some reason don't react that well to the limited edition um, game, if you will, not just with uh, our stuff, but with other brands too. They prefer to, to have the, the long-term, you know, if you like a cigar, they want to come back and keep buying it. So uh, in, in a lot of our customers, um, you got to remember, if the guy's smoking Padron Anniversaries, he's pretty happy with that. Or if he's smoking, you know, Atabase or, or Davidoff's or Diamond Crowns or, you know, any of these established high quality cigars, it's pretty hard to get them off of that once, once they're, they're on those things. Um, so um, it just doesn't do as well, the, 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 the one and dones for us. I, I know I, I, a lot of, you know, I didn't even think of that till you just said it because I've smoked a lot of those, like the Boris's, the Vans, um, the House Resolution. I'm thinking Hercules. I love that Hercules one that Rocky did for you. So, yeah, I didn't even think about those. Those are ongoing brands for years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, and Abe, let me give you a good, uh, let yeah, me jump in real quick yeah. since Dave's here. So, for example, like Dave, we did a 25th anniversary at a bay in, in uh, Byron. And I, I, you know, I keep saying, when we do a 25th, I want to keep it running. And so that's the idea. Unfortunately, we're going to be sold out of those. There's major supply chain issues with these incredible boxes that Atabay does. But, you know, that's something we want to, we want to be able to keep going because it's a great product. And so, um, you know, why stop it? So it's like Padron 64s, or, you know, or their 80, all their limited editions are still available, you know, because they're unique products and they continue to make them other than the Millennium. Um, and I wouldn't wish you'd be able to make more of those because we'd sell the heck out of them. But that's about his only limited edition cigar that they haven't continued to produce. Yeah. Now, Abe, you've been the opposite. You've done the micro blend series over the years. And, um, you know, that's been enormous success. It's one of the you know iconic series that you've had. I remember when it first launched, you had four. You could originally do four blends. This thing's now getting close to 20 right now. So. 17 17 yep yep um you know to do what jeff does you're basically a manufacturer you know and i you know i'm i don't want to hunt down boxes i don't want to you know it, it's it's a job and and for me especially the artistic side of me and, and 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 the creative side of me i love these little projects um um they're a lot of fun and uh working with these guys and Look, I've been blessed, you know, I mean, you know, maybe today it's a lot easier, but, you know, back when we really started this, we weren't, our footprint wasn't that big. Um, and to have worked with, in my first year of doing this, you know, uh, my father, Fuente, you know, Pete Johnson and Padron. <laughs> it was kind yeah, of a hell of a yeah. come out of that, right? And I think at the time Padron did ours, I think they only, we were maybe only the third time they had, had ever done a, a store uh, exclusive um one day was unheard of i mean when i remember when that came out i got blessed yeah. i got yeah. blessed twice there so yeah. yeah these projects are fun and it keeps my creative juices going and and um it's just a different model you know i mean every you know i don't care whether it's food or cigar you, know, you always just want something different you know i mean you know, you, nobody eats the same steak or the same meal every day or the same type of breakfast and and i i, I think the cons I mean, Jeff space is different. Our consumers look forward to it, you know? And, and like I said, we, you know, one of our the now becoming the most successful ones. And, and this, this is one of the problems that, of why I like the, the smaller projects and they're not, they're not set small. I mean, red meat lovers on this release is almost 2000 boxes. Um, hit, there's a broad leaf shortage, you know I mean? I mean, and then, you know, it, it was, you know, Thank God, you know, these got done, but, you know, you run into those problems with longevity. So these little projects are, are, are really nice and clean and simple and in and out. Um, but um, we just have, I just have a lot of fun and, and our base seems to look forward to it. You know, the, uh, I think the consumers like, look, 
just like anything, whether it's the, the shoe business, right? There's an excitement to something that that I think, especially if it's good. Because look, the, the, what's really happened, unfortunately, over the last decade or two is <laughs> there's a lot of people who really don't put the effort to try to make something, you know, we, we do, you know, I mean, we work on a project, you know, we'll show pictures of it. And maybe we're lucky if a year later, year and a half, it comes to fruition. Um, in fact, the one I've been working on, Matt Booth, we actually started talking about six years ago. <laughs> I remember this, that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. The third rendition of it. And, you know, it's going to drop this year, uh, 2022. Um, but, um, you know, for us, it's, we've enjoyed it. I think our consumer base have enjoyed it, and it's it's been exciting. And uh, I think it translates to a certain percentage of consumers where they do look forward to something like that. And just like anything, as long as you keep stuff engaging and exciting and fun, I think it's part of the culture and the lifestyle that we kind of really most of us enjoy. That's why we go to the trade show. We get excited, you know. When 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 Fuente and and Padron said they were going to do that you know, collaboration project. I mean, the whole, everybody was talking about it. Man. What an amazing thing. Whether it ever comes to fruition or not, you might know better than I do at this point. But, um, we all get excited. I mean, it's one of the things when we go to the trade show, we're like, oh, I heard about this. Let me go take a look at it. So I, I think that, I think that trickles down to the consumer level as well. Yep, I agree. Now, Dave, you've, you've done a lot as well. I mean, the Firecracker series, it's grown. Um, that's now distributed through United as well. Uh, some great releases there. You've done some limiteds as well. You've done a lot. You've done a lot, actually. Uh, when I when I kind of was just looking back at this, how, how has this been important to you? Well, Jeff's one hundred percent right. When it when it comes to a smart business move, it, it, it is not to be one and done because now you have all the work to get somebody on it, liking it. They're all set, and then saying, okay. You hate to say, uh, I can't give this to you anymore to a customer. Uh, but at the same time, I got these creative things that I cannot control myself, that I have to finish. Something's in my mind. It's on a pad of paper. And some of these things have been years going and it's sitting there and I'm looking at it and I, I can't rest. I have to uh, pull it off to see if this thing is going to work or not. And it, as much as I've had winners, I've had losers. Believe me, I've had more losers than winners. Uh, so I should stop this madness, but I'm just curious to see what happens. 37 years in the cigar business, I have to keep myself entertained at the same time. And it entertains me to do it. I love to do it and put it together. And, uh, you know, going to manufacturers with these crazy things, uh, some of which have been done and some of which never, never been done because no one's willing to do them. Um, but, uh, they sit there and I'm just waiting for the next guy to end up saying, okay, I'll end up giving this a try. Uh, I don't know. I just, it's the creativeness that I have to end up pulling, pulling it off. Sure. I, I can make another Toro like anybody else, but um, what about if we shaped it this way? Or what if we do that? And what would end up happening? You, the poor blenders that I've sat with over the years with, with, um, um, you know, somebody that speaks Spanish because I don't and sit with them and try to explain what I want to do. It's comical. It could be, a, it could be a TV show of these guys, you know, shaking their head as I'm doing it. And then the project comes together and it's out there and I just love it. And um, I, I have to tell you that there's, there's so many, COVID actually slowed me down that I have two years of things that were in the works during this COVID thing, and it cannot be completed until I get down to Nicaragua, Honduras, or Dominican Republic, because the final thing is I have to actually touch it, make sure before we go into production. But there's so many things in the works that, that it's madness. So when I think next year, it's going to look like, oh my God, this influx of things he did, but keep in mind that it's three years worth of stuff all going to come out at once. <laughs> It's going to seem like, and uh, because I'm worried about it, it's, it, it's going to be looking like, uh, okay, he's losing his mind now. He's just, he's gone too far, but these things have been in the works and, and just about ready to go. So uh, it's coming folks. It's coming. And uh, I apologize in advance for some, some of this ridiculous stuff, but uh, it, it's fun for me and I, I can't shut it off. Unfortunately. Oh, that's good. That's good to hear. Glad to hear all you guys are creative there with that. 
Um, well, I, I want to. There's there's something that Dave did that I thought was the, one of the coolest things though. His little smoking man ashtray. I don't know if you have one. I have one. I think, I think that's the coolest little thing. And uh, and so um, anyway, hats off to you on that. Um, we're working on something. It's not a smoking man ashtray, but uh, we're we're borrowing the smoke coming out of a out of a different hole on an ashtray concept. And, All right, uh, good, good. So I, I hope one of these days. I hope it comes out. And uh, Dave, it'll be on your desk hopefully, where you'll have uh, that next year smoking man ashtray rolling coal you know, you know there's been a couple of things i've done over the years and when i when i get a call from you uh one of the things i can remember when i did cigaropoly and you gave me a call on that and you said i need to have one of those what is it going to take do i actually have to buy the thing i said no no i'm gonna i'm gonna send i'm gonna send you one but I, i'm so happy when somebody like you is so into it that I have to have this because that's the whole purpose of these things. I'm looking at the consumer. Is there a consumer out there that says, I have to have this period. That's it. And that that's been the success of the firecracker stuff that it doesn't really matter the manufacturer that makes it anymore. These people have need to have the next one, whatever that is. And I don't want to let them down either. I want to make them better and better as it goes on too. That's part of what ends up happening, but I could take the easy way around and it wouldn't matter, but no, the, the, you know, we have it planned as, um, as Abe was saying, these things are planned years in advance. It's, it's not like I just said, okay, now 2022 is done. 2023 is done. The manufacturers are coming to me and saying, geez, I want to do that with you. And I go, I'm all set till 2025. What do you want to do? And they're like, 2025, I'm getting old. And I go, well, I'm all set for the, for the next three years. It's, it's all done. So how about this other crazy idea? And then we, we work, you know, we, we put the cigar bar out again after 10 years, uh, this year and, th and that's what happened there of uh can we do another firecracker and it's no but i have this what do you think um aladino want to do the firecracker you know can, can we do the firecracker and i go no but how about if you take your round cigar we'll box press it we'll put three box press in a bar and it's going to be a cigar bar and he's like i don't know let, let me see and then he goes all right i'm going to end up doing it and and it was fun and i and now can I do another one for next year? Yep, that's all set. And we'll start working on that until I come up with some other goofy thing to end up doing it. it, it the, I'll tell you, the consumer smiles. They buy it. You know, they take pictures of it and social media it. And that makes me smile, too, to see it's out there. There's, there's no more to sell as soon as they, they are all sold all at once, right? Through United Cigar, they have everybody planned. Boom, everything's sold. But then to see it up there and I go, okay, somebody gave a shit to take a picture of it and put it on their social media page. And I'm like, wow, that, that's that's really cool. I remember one time going down to Florida and I was on St. Armand Circle and walking around there. I had an ice cream cone. I'm walking around St. Armand Circle of Florida and I walked by an ashtray and I take three steps back and I look in the ashtray and there was one of my cigars. This is a long time ago. I, I believe it was classic cigars. I look, look at it down there and you could have bought me a steak dinner. You could have done whatever, but you couldn't do what that feeling was to see something like that 1500 miles away and see it there. And I'm like, Oh my God, there's some guy right here right now to put that cigar in there. And he has no idea that I invented that thing. And it, it just, I don't know. That's what I get off on. It's weird shit. That's great. That's awesome. That's an awesome uh, thing to, to see happen. All right. Uh, turning to the next topic, media outlets. Um, so Abe and Jeff, um, and Abe and Dave, you, you know, you have well-known uh, programs. Jeff, you've kind of taken things a little different. So actually, I'm going to go to you first here. Well, you don't have a podcast. I still think you have leveraged media very well. Whether it was, like I said, I first found out about you listening to Cigar Dave years ago with your, your, your guest spots. Um, recently, you have partnered, I know, with Aaron and some other media outlets on the pairing uh, shows, which have been excellent. Um, I bought a lot of those packs, uh, which were really good. I learned a lot from them. Talk about, you know, while you don't have a podcast, talk about your importance of, of like media, uh, working with media as far as that goes. Yeah. So I remember when, uh, I'm sure you guys remember too, um, 
when this alternative media, when people were turning their, their nose up at it, um, like you guys weren't allowed at the trade show and stuff and were your real media outlets and stuff. And I was like, um, anybody could see what was going on. This is not, this is real media. This is what it's all about. So were we an early adapter to it? I guess, but, but how could you not be? Cause, cause that's, that's where I was going for information, right? Whether it's about cigars or anything else. So um, what, what I did differently and, and I applaud what, what, here's the thing, what Abe does, you know, what all four of you guys do, most people have no idea the commitment that it takes to do what you guys do. And I, when I was, before I started Corona Cigar, I was in an automotive service industry and we were open six days a week. Back when we had the gas station, we were open seven days a week. And uh, when I, all through high school and college, I worked every Saturday, every Sunday, and then uh, one of the reasons I exited the automotive industry and started Chrono Cigar was I didn't want to um, be 60 years old and working six days a week and only having Sunday off. And we're too damn tired to even do anything. So when it came to the media, I knew the commitment that, that's there. It means like every Saturday, your, your, your day shot. So for me, I, I, I try to keep a really good work-life balance. Uh, and spend, I spent a ton of time with my kids and, and family and stuff. So um, that's why I never wanted to do the commitment. Now, is there a downfall of that? Of course. You know, listen, when you have your own show, that's you, you, you control the message. It's your, it's your own advertising. Advertising is expensive. So when you have your own show, it's brilliant what, you know, what Dave's done and Abe's done and others. There's, there's a lot of guys doing this. But for me, I, I just didn't want to do this. So since I don't want to do a show, because and I was approached by a lot of radio stations and stuff when they were wanting to wanting to fill these uh, these segments on Saturdays, and I said no. What I'd rather do is I'll sponsor the show. So you know, I brought Cigar Dave to the Orlando market. Uh, I, I'd sponsored Abe's show in Tampa when he was on Salem Radio. Um, I, I try to sponsor people that that do it, and and so um, that's our that's our way of uh, of being involved in it. And I make myself available. To, 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 to podcasts and shows, even guys that are startups, man. And, 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 and like, there's, there's other retailers. I know there's, there's a retailer in Jacksonville, young guy. And it's like, you know, I, I want to go on a show and, and just try to help too, because um, you know, th- if you can, get, you know, there's questions that people will have and if you can do things to help their business or whatever, let's do it. So um, I've embraced it and it's important. And I think what we've seen now, just like we said today, when, you sent out an email to the three of us. We all answered within uh, minutes. Yeah, we'd love to be on Coop's show. And that's because of the respect uh, and credibility you have. And there's a lot of guys that, that have these shows that have that, that, have that same credibility. Um, in the past, the message was controlled by one magazine. Uh, and, and I'm not, I mean, I love Cigar Aficionado as well. But when you have, that was the rating and the only real, advertising and, and method for cigars to, 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 to be uh, for a consumer to say, Hey, is this good or not? So uh, it, it's much better when you have a wider audience and a much broader spectrum of people tasting cigars and talking about stuff and talking about the industry. So, so that's where I'm at on it. And again, uh, I appreciate what, uh, what everybody does. And I, and, and I know how much hard work uh, Dave, Abe, uh, all of you guys do uh, on those shows. And, and I, and, and I think it serves, a, it's like a community service in my opinion and that's why i've said to i sponsor another show on uh salem radio which i know listen roi it doesn't exist meaning that a lot of these shows don't have enough listeners to pay for what it costs to advertise but you know what's more important for me having the conversation about cigars out there having it broadcast having people talk about cigars in a positive light because if you back up to when i first started in 25 years ago remember we had major attacks by the anti-tobacco people and they were throwing a wide cast net as if premium cigars were the same thing as marble cigarettes so i viewed every dollar that 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 we spend supporting any type of cigar media as it's 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 part of the battle plan against the anti-tobacco people now if you look we're at today why do i think there's so many younger people enjoying cigars 
because they, they, they understand the difference between cigars and cigarettes. We've had so much consumer education that's come from all these shows that there's not that many people that think a marble cigarette in a, in a Opus X are the same thing. And so that's the long, that's the long-term play. And that's why it's important for everybody to continue with this, this uh, wonderful method of communicating. Is there, but at the same time, I am concerned about the future when they pull the plug on all this with the, the censorship that goes on for, for uh, yep. you know, products that they don't deem um, acceptable. Very, very true. Now, Abe, I mean, KMA, uh, 10 years. And um, I can tell you, I remember the first KMA show. I, wa I watched it, listened to it actually in my backyard. It was show two. Uh, it was the Zycar show. You had the Zycar guys on. Uh, I think it was Kurt and Scott. Um, so I do remember the first show I listened to that with that. Um, how important has this been to you now 10 years later? I mean, have you ever gotten tired maybe of doing it at this point? Well, yeah, I've, I've had my frustrations without a doubt. Right. Um, but I, I've always liked the cigar media. I mean, I was We lost Abe. Did we lose Abe? We lost yeah. Abe. All right, we'll go. We'll go to Dave. Um. So it was interesting during during the COVID thing, seeing all the different people coming out and all the Zooms calls would happen, and everybody was doing it at that point. And then I I got concerned at that point and said. Oh my God, because some of it was, was garbage that was coming in. Some of it, it wasn't, it, it was very theatrical and some money was spent in there, but then it comes down to, okay, how much can these people end up hanging on at this point? Because it is true what Jeff said. It is a lot of work to prep. Uh, you guys know exactly what it is, Abe, if he's back on he, to get ready for a show is, you know, we, we do a two hour show all of us, I think, is, is, is around that type of timeline. Uh, Coop, you go even further than that with multiple shows. Um, it takes longer to prep for a show than to actually do the show. Oh, absolutely. So the, 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 the commitment is unbelievable. And when I hit my 10-year anniversary of doing the Cigar Authority, I really considered of stopping at that point. And we talked about it nine and a half years in, and I met with the other guys and I said, what do you think? We'll hit a milestone of 10 years. We break the record because there was somebody out there doing it that long and break the record and then call it quits. We did what we did. You know, are well, we going to start regurgitating? And I brought it up on the show that, yeah, hey, you know, we may stop or whatever. We're thinking about it. We're talking about it because the other guys had no problem either. They said, oh my God, I can get um, on Barry's end he gets he's off on Saturday. He says, I can really be off because at 12 noon, it really screws up the entire day, morning and afternoon. And uh, uh, Jonathan, who, who uh, works the sales floor, it's, it's the busiest day of the week. He's like, wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, so I bring it up on the show and we get literally hundreds and hundreds of emails don't do it. It's part of my ritual, blah, 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 and all the stuff like this. And, and, and then it dawns on me how important it is. And, and I didn't think, you know, we were out there goofing around and, and talking about cigars and, and shooting the shit. But to some people, it's really important for them. It's part of their thing that they come and visit the store and, oh, my God, I feel like I know you type of thing. And I don't know this person, never met them, nor spoke to them. But it's a whole different thing. And to, to lengthen the story out, but I went to a funeral of one of my customers who passed away. It was a freak uh, thing during a, uh, a routine um, um, uh, operation that he had that he died from the anesthesia. And at the church... Um, the priest was talking about two guys smoke shop and here I am sitting at the pew and I'm like, why are they talking about two guys smoke shop? And they were talking about this guy's two families that he had. One of his families was his family that was sitting in the front row and the other family was two guys smoke shop. I'm like, what the heck are they talking about? And then at the grave site, they took a piece of the casket 
off the casket before they put it in, handed it to the wife who called me up and she handed it to me. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Tears are coming down my eyes. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. And then after it's over, everybody said, don't you understand what two guys smoke shop is? And I said, we sell cigars at the store. And they said, no, this is the people, our customers, this is another part of their life. It's very, very important that we vacation with people that we met at Two Guys Smoke Shop and never knew them from a hole in the head. And there's so much that goes on with this. And little did I know, and I'm, I'll let you know, Coop, uh, the same thing's happening within your show, in your chat box, that people are chatting with each other and becoming friends yeah. with each other. And the same thing happens to me and, and it's happening to Abe. And we're doing something more than doing a podcast there's, there's many, many people that are involved that we have no idea who they are. And w when it comes down to that and you start thinking about it, it, it's, it's no longer the advertisement. It's no longer the promotion of whatever I'm trying to accomplish on the cigar authority, the information that I can put out. There's more to it. It's bigger than me. So at that point I said, okay, I'm going to keep doing it until I can't do it anymore or till, till it, till it gets lousy or whatever, but you'll see that, that, all those people that jumped in in COVID, did, that did not happen with them. And it's a lot of work. And then they said, okay, I'm out. I'm willing to actually yeah. suck it up and, yep. and do all the work anyway for all those people. And I think it, it, as Jeff said, it is good for our industry. You are not my competitor, you guys at all, nor ABIS or any show that goes on on there. You are good for the industry. This is what we were saying when we were at the PCA, when they were saying, get these bloggers out of here. Uh, they, they shouldn't be part of the show. And I said, you are so wrong. These people love this industry more than you do, if you're saying that, because they're good for the industry, that the time and effort that they put in, you should embrace them, Thank God for them. Listen, you can talk about Cigar Aficionado. Cigar Aficionado is a business, and they're doing it for big business purposes. And I love them, and I'm, I'm grateful that they did it, and I owe them part of my success is because of them. But for you guys that, you, you, you know, not even in the cigar business, your love of the cigar industry, so much so, to go through the bar that you have to do, I mean, it's the best thing that ever happened to our industry. Yep, thank you. And, and Dave, thank you. And just so you know, uh, your first show I listened to was on it was a it was uh, on demand. Um, my friend Andy had brought me back the Atabay from your store. And um, like he was just telling me, you got to smoke this cigar. And he brought me one back and it was amazing. And um, I listened to the show where you came back from IPCPR. And you were kind of talking about how this was the greatest cigar you ever smoked. You it went back behind the curtain to find out what people yeah, were wanted, talking wanted, about. Yeah, so that's how I got introduced to the Cigar Authority with that one. Yeah, yeah so. and, and I, I got to thank Rocky Patel for that because the oddest thing of all, and if you, you know Rocky, I get to Rocky's booth. I place my order with him. I'm done with him. And he said, did you go look at that? And I said, what is that? And he says, you got to go look at this. This is the greatest thing I ever saw. You got to go back there. And I went back there and I, I you know, oh, my God, what is this? Yep. What's this all about? I have to have this thing. And it, it was a, a couple of years later when they uh, Nelson Alfonso, who owns the company, ended up saying to me, I need you to be the distributor of this. And he was with the distributor. And he's telling me this in front of the distributor. It was, a, it was out of said, California. It was being distributed out of California. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, no, no. I said, uh, you know, I'm figuring his, his broken English and he's not understanding how this works. I said, you sell to him and I buy from him. No, no, no. I said, I know that's how it works. In other words, I'm not stupid. I understand how this works. He says, but I want it to go to you. And I said, no, no, absolutely not. And the, the man that had the distribution to it said, no, no, it's OK. And I said, no, it's not OK. I, I will not do that. And he said, the thing is, you are so excited about it. I need it to be somebody like you because no other way is this going to end up working. It can't just work as another page from a distributor that's in there. And I said, well, I have my own stuff, too. It's going to be another page. He says, oh, no. He says, I listen to you. Uh, you talk about this more than you talk about your own products. 
and, and the, the reason is it is my favorite cigar of everything I've ever had. It's the truth. It's my favorite cigar. And after a few days of him working me and stuff and uh, agreeing with the guy from California that was the distributor, I said, OK, I'm going to give it a try. But I'm very little. I'm very, very little. I, you know, we had. 14 accounts or some little ridiculous number at the time. And that was actually 10 years ago. So December 17th this year will be 10 years. And, you know, wow. the, I always say it takes 10 years to be an overnight sensation. But I took the distribution uh, 10 years ago, December 17th. And I know it's December 17th because Nelson called me about three months ago. And he says, I want to have a meeting with you on Skype on December 17th. And it must be December 17th. He said, I got some surprises for you. You're going to be excited about this uh, December 17th. And I said, what's December 17th? And he says, it's the day I want to have the meeting, but it must be that day. And then I look into it and that was the day. So I don't know, I don't know what surprises he has up his sleeve, but it's 10 years with that brand. And to most people, it's a brand new brand, but it, it wasn't for me. Uh, I remember trying that cigar for the first time. I love it. It's not mine by any means. And to be honest, I mean, it was my first time distributing for somebody major mistake, by the way, Jeff, I want you to hear this. Um, there's very, very little in it for me at all. I didn't know how to negotiate a distribution deal and how much I would need to end up doing this type of thing. It's a, it's a lost leader for me, but, um, it's a great product. And I wanted this guy successful. Um, you know, when he came out, so did Hiroshi Robania. These are two people yep. that ended up coming out around the same time. And Hiroshi came out like, like unbelievable jets, jet started and crashed and burned. And Atabe Byron Bandolero just kept going up, up, up as, as it's going on more of my style. You know, I don't want to shoot to the moon and then because the, the higher they go up, the harder they fall. It's been a slow ride, but uh, that's usually the success in the industry of something gradually getting great. Much like Jeff saying, that, you know, I want this person to be able to smoke the cigar for a long period of time, as opposed to, boom, 500 boxes go out in a day, and then there's nothing after that. Unfortunately for Hiroshi, it, it seemed like that. There's, there's another guy of the can he survive uh, that's out there. Um, and, and not that there was anything wrong with that product. It was just it took off almost too fast. Sure. Hey, and you have a course. Real quick, though, Dave really had the foresight on the Atabay because when I first start, saw it, uh, I didn't bring it in. And then uh, but Dave kept saying, Jeff, this thing's I'm telling you, this thing sells, it sells. And then uh, once they tweaked the, the got out of the jars and into some boxes and stuff, we put that was because of you. And, that was because yeah. of you. Well, which well, is a good let's, point. Yeah. Well, I just say as a retailer, I don't know if, uh, if Abe ever had these. Remember when Tony Burhani had those ceramic jars that had those yeah. those. Uh, it, there's Trinidad's in them and they were great yeah. cigars, but, but for every one cigar that a customer pulled out and bought, there was six damaged ones in the yeah. jar. Yeah. And that's the problem, especially Atabay's are expensive. And yeah. so, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the Atabay and Byron, the packaging and it, it goes, the, the cigars, the packaging, everything's been tremendous success uh, in the industry for, for us. It has. Yep. Abe, you got cut off, so I want to kind of give let you kind of close out your thoughts on the media piece. You killed my battery, Coop. <laughs> so you, you know there's something called a charger, right? I didn't plan on it. I, had <laughs> I, had we got, I thought it would be fine. Um, so, I, look, I, I embraced the secondary media early, early on, and this was even before I had KMA. Um, I'm going to share another cool uh, IPCP, RPCA board story, but um, I'll never forget when we did our first Anarchy, the original release, the first one of all our microbud series. The first thing I did was I reached out to, I think it was about maybe 14 at the time. Um, I, mean, I mean, most, almost all those guys are gone. Almost all those guys are gone. Um, but we reached out 14 guys, we sent them two of the Anarchies to try and, and what a success that project turned out. And it was actually, I don't know if you guys remember this, the time we were on the board together that the board finally made a P media pass um, to allow, uh, we were there when that happened, we, we voted it through to allow um, 
bloggers, media guys to, to get on the trade show floor and actually get a badge just as sneaking in and finding ways to get on the show floor <laughs> alternatively. So um, I've always embraced it before I got into KMA and I, I didn't want to do KMA. Um, I was approached, I, I, I look, I've always been a supporter that anything that propagates the cigar lifestyle and culture. And I've always ran the media side of my company that way. Dave's been on my show, Jeff's been on my show, other retailers have been on my show. I've covered other major events that had nothing to do with my organization because I'm a firm believer that a high tide raises all ships, especially in what we do and the culture we have. It's very finite. It's not all extensive. So to anything that helps broaden that culture, propagates the culture and lifestyle is, is a great thing for our industry. So I've always ran the media side that way, but I, I, I used to uh, advertise in the Cigar Dave show. And um, when, I guess, for whatever reason, he, he left the market, I was approached by the program director from uh, iHeartMedia. And they wanted me to do a show, and I absolutely didn't want to do it. I really had no idea what to do. And uh, one, two of my guys at the time worked, at, at that time it was Clear Channel, um, worked with them, and they talked me into doing it, and we only signed a 13-week contract. That's it. 13 weeks. is going to have a little fun, do this hour show. And never thought in a million years it was going to be going on for 10 years and almost 500 episodes now. But why it's been successful is, you know, what I do, Coop, is, you know, a lot more fun than what you do. And I think I've said it to you. I mean, it is. It's a, it's a different it's a different animal. Yeah, you you got two shows a week and scheduling and planning on top of a real life job and family. And like, I, you know, it, it really is a testament. I can't remember which one of you guys said it, man, the, the amount of work that goes in for guys like you is, is unfounded. Um, but it, it's now not a thing. It's becoming sharing my Saturday mornings with 80 to hundred people every day. It's like the best way for me to start my Saturdays. I think that's why the show has been successful and why None of us have really gotten tired of doing it. Well, even though some of the cast have changed over the years, where they moved or moved on, but um, I look forward to it. And it's part of my kids' culture, man. They've all been in the studio. Yep. They've all come to me. They've been on the air. You know, they know the scoop with Coop. Um, I mean, it's, it's just great. So I, I love it. I, I love having the voice. But it's, it's really taking, you know, as my business grew, and I got more involved and things became more elaborate that that sharing and passionate of sitting around and, and having just like lounge time in the shop disappeared right you, know, you just don't get those moments anymore because when you're at work you're just running and and, and and don't have that time so that's what that's that's what those saturday mornings became for me personally it was that outlet that time like we're doing now we're just sitting around talking me and my co-hosts the people who watch us every saturday and it became just a fun outlet for us. And then it it grew more on social media. And now we found a way to really do it well on social media. And, and it, it just uh, become an, a, a, a huge extension of our company and how we connect with all the other aficionados out there who share the same passion we have. So yeah, it, it's a big part of our company. Very good, I agree. Okay. Um I got one more segment for you guys. It's some rapid fire questions, and then I, I promise I won't keep you much longer. Uh, but I got to do I got to do a couple of uh, sponsor breaks. If you guys are okay with that, um, so let me mention um, first uh, the Great Smoke. Uh, this year's Mega Scar event is breaking barriers once again, returning with a live in person event and broadcasting live virtually into the comfort of your own home. Michael Herkarts will be reprising his role as co-host for the main event, broadcasting special segments from the TGS on-site studio and in the field for all the virtual attendees at home. Adding more fun to the party this year, the Great Smoke 2022 features a whopping four days of pre-event parties, after parties, and of course, the main event itself. For those making the trek to the Sunshine Steak, get out your favorite Hawaiian shirt and be prepared to get laid. You can find more and get tickets at www.thegreatsmoke.com. And I want to mention Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has five generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of the Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now the Cuevas family brings their very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. Try the Casa Cuevas Connecticut, the Casa Cuevas Abano, Casa Cuevas Maduro, La Manderia, and Patrimonio, as well as the Cuevas Reserve Line. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your old good tailor for Casa Cuevas Cigars. 
Cots and Corporate Cigars from our casa to yours, and by Aventura Cigars. Aventura Explorer is the first creation by Marcel Noble and Henderson Ventura. Immediately after lighting up the Explorer, the Mexican wrapper will delight the aficionado with its dark chocolate flavor. After a while and pleasure, the Dominican filler will flatter the aficionado's palate with wonderful spicy and leathery aromas and unite it with the wooden sweetness from Ecuador. Try Aventura, the Explorer, and explore the wonderful experience. So we'll get to these last uh, few questions yet. Um, I'm going to go a little out of order of what I planned, Aaron, just, you know, because I, I want to ask this question first. Aaron's um, here. I am. <laughs> Aaron. I, I, <laughs> Aaron's keeping me honest, trust me. Um, so I wanna, this question I want to ask first, because two of you have been doing this. Abe, you, you're probably the one who doesn't do this, right? So I'm kind of curious on this. Um, catalogs. So Jeff, you have been a catalog guy for as long as I know. Dave, you've recently kind of dabbled into the catalog space. Abe, you haven't gone into catalogs as far as I know. So I kind of want to get some just thoughts on catalogs. And I'm going to start off with you, Jeff, because catalogs, I mean, I know that's a big part of your business. I mean, I've been up in the offices. I've seen them kind of working on those things. A lot of work that goes into that. Talk about the importance of catalogs to you. Dave's been doing them longer than me, probably. <laughs> Really? 1994. But you stopped yeah. for a while, Dave, didn't you? I did. I stopped for a long time. Okay. Yeah. So, so I started out as that because I started Corona Cigar while I was still uh, running uh, the, the auto center. And by the way, I'm at 6%. For some reason, my charger's not keeping up. So if I, if I cut off, I'll go to my cell phone. Okay. But anyway, I started uh, – oh, man. Close. <laughs> I started as a catalog company. Um, because that's that's just the way Corona was. We didn't have a retail store, and uh, we've continued. Now, catalogs are they are they do they pay for themselves? Well, that's questionable. At the time, back in the '90s, heck yeah, uh, even through the early you know 2000s. But now, with uh, the cost of printing and postage, postage is so expensive. Um, but you know, it's it, it's. Once you built a company on that, you don't necessarily want to stop. And that's kind of the way I feel about it. So um, the, it, it's definitely good reading materials, pretty pictures for people and everything else. But uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we're going to continue to do them. If I started Corona Cigar today, would I do it? Um, I don't know. I, it's, that's a tough one just because of the cost of postage. Understand that. I mean, I, I enjoy always getting the catalog and reading through it. Uh, cause it's kind of a little magazine is what I've noticed. Now, Dave, yes. you brought back the catalog, right? Um, and I think you've written a lot of the catalog yourself. Uh, cause I've, I've read a lot of the stuff in there. I've learned a lot of stuff in there. I mean, I was just smoking a Buelo. I learned a lot of background about, about a Buelo in that catalog. So you decided to relaunch your catalogs this year. I did. I thought I'd talk to um, people that don't listen to the Cigar Authority that are my customers, which is the majority of my customers have no idea what the Cigar Authority even is. So these these brands that are out there uh, that they may see in the store and just overlook them. Uh, and, and much like Abe, I'm not on the show floor like I used to be. And I loved it. But there's three different stores. Plus there's the online segment, plus United Cigar, plus properties. I got lots of different businesses going on and I just can't do it all. I'd love to, but it's impossible. So I said, let me tell the story uh, in the catalog of what I would say to somebody uh, maybe on the, on the show floor. Uh, I always believed in the storytelling aspect of cigars. Anyway, there's wonderful stories in the cigar industry and these brands all have stories. So that was the idea of it. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, no, it doesn't pay off because I'm, I'm, I'm a math guy. I mean, I, I run numbers all the time and it doesn't end up paying for itself. Uh, may, but you know, part of it, again, is becomes marketing. It's not uh, that um, I, I got very friendly with the folks at Thompson, uh, Bob Franzbau, for years. And Bob used to invite me down and I'd say, listen, Bob, I'm your competitor. And he goes, David, you're not a competitor. He flew me on his jet. He took me on his yachts and uh, just, just a good, good guy. And uh, I saw um, really how catalog business 
operated and every square inch is measured and he explained that to me of, of how it works and how something moves in front and in back within a catalog because he was a catalog guy not just in the cigar industry but in the betting industry in the coffee industry so he had all these different catalog things and departments and photographers and writers and i mean he, he legit real deal so uh that's really why I probably ended up stopping because I learned how much I'm losing every single catalog that I put out. And I said, okay, it's just not working. And at that, at that point online was starting anyway and websites and all that. And you could send emails out and accomplish uh, most of what you were doing with a catalog anyway. So again, why end up doing it? Enough time went by. I missed it, to be honest. Uh, and I said, maybe somebody else misses it also. Uh, folding the little corner of, of the page that you're interested in, marking the catalog down. This is the type of person I was anyway, going through catalogs of all things and learning a little something at the same time. But mathematically, no, it doesn't work. It's a thing of the past, unfortunately. And it's not the printing of it. It is the mailing of the, of the catalog you know you, you're into it for at least a dollar per catalog that gets mailed out uh and you're talking you know a hundred thousand catalogs plus the design work and everything else that goes into it you're so deep into it are you going to recoup that into profits unfortunately no um and the people that are out there um, are putting out catalogs that do it and it's discount catalogs. And I don't think any of us three that are on here, which is a very interesting panel that's on here. We are about customer service in our businesses. We are, none of us are deep discounters at all. So, it, it, you know, it, that, that belongs to somebody that say, wow, only $3 per cigar, things like that, or, you know, regularly $200 with a line through it, $49. That's not me either. So uh, the person really doesn't uh, buy giant when they end up seeing it. Does something end up happening to them over time that they learned it? Well, now let me try that cigar. Maybe. But um, all the math I do uh, says no, uh, it, it doesn't work. But that doesn't say I won't come up with another one because everything is in dollars and cents. Got it. Abe? I know you don't do catalogs. Is it something you maybe did in the past? Have you thought about it? What's your thoughts on You're that? Exactly why after those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest with you, Jeff, Jeff's one of the guys I actually approached to talk to about it one time. Basically advised me, don't do it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I, I, I developed late. Jeff and Dave were both well-established long before we, we were. And, you know, go back further. And like Jeff said, he started as a catalog. By the time I got into e-commerce, you know, websites were already big. And um, it just didn't make sense to, to start a catalog at, the, at this point. And by the time, look, a catalog is a very expensive monthly venture or quarterly venture, or however often you do it. It's between the printing and the post, it's not a cheap investment. And by the time we actually got to the point where we could have afforded maybe to do a catalog, whatever, after talking with some of my peers in the industry, they're like, yeah, I don't even bother at this point. You know, basically yeah. what Jeff said, what Jeff said now, he told me, he's like, if I was starting Corona company today, I would, I would do a catalog. Sure. Um, and honestly, it, it's a lot of work. I know just because I have a graphic background and, 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 you know, been involved in doing printing and stuff. That's it, a whole other monster. I mean, it needs its own department. And, um, and look, the world's going digital. I mean, you know, it's just the way it is. When's the last time you seen a Sear Roebuck catalog? I mean, it's just it's the way it is. But no, I, I maybe entertained it for a quick second. I think Jeff talked me out of it real quick. Okay. Now, this is actually, Dave, you made a point, and I think this kind of ties in. Um, I'm going to kind of combine these three. Um, importance of staying at MSRP. When do you discount and when do you clear? And what, what goes into those decisions? So, Abe, I want to turn that over to you first because you've kind of educated me a lot on this piece, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, for sure. So I want to kind of get your thoughts on that one. So repeat that question again. So thoughts on, you know, importance of keeping MSRP. When do you discount and when do you clear it out, like, completely? Well, what I mean, goes into those decisions? Everybody runs their, their, their business, you know, slightly differently and, and has different ways to go about things. I mean, look, part of the MSRP... 
I, 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 you know, today, especially with a lot of companies and the way they're structured is look, there's a value to any brand name. And if you look at models like Mont Blanc or whatever, when, when, their, when, when their pens started going into office depots and stuff like that, and what it did for the brand and, and the value of the brand, um, it, it, the pens didn't get any cheaper or any less quality. It's just the perception of what the value was changed. And they revisited that whole thing. And now they're, they have these beautiful high-end stores now and malls, and you can't find those pens where you used to find them anymore. So, you know, a lot of retailers, a lot of consumers don't understand a manufacturer's need to have an MSRP and say, this is the value of the product I create. I mean, Steve Saka could hold, do a whole dissertation on, on why his cigars are priced the way they are. So, you know, we always like respect that as much as possible. We'll always follow map pricing. And, 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 you know, for us, for us as a retailer, like, you know, whenever there's a price increase or something like S-chip, you know, the way I've always looked at it is, that, look, every consumer has a threshold. It doesn't really affect us on the retail side. It affects the manufacturers more than it affects us. Because if you have a guy who's buying a cigar that he loves and it's a $6 cigar and all of a sudden it becomes a $7 cigar, well, he, that consumer makes a decision at that point. Either he says, okay, I'm, I like the cigar so much, I'm going to start paying the $7 for the cigar. Or he's going to start looking at the humidor for another $6 cigar he likes. So it, it doesn't really affect us on that, um, on that level you know, when, the, when the prices increase like that. Um, the consumers are going to find where they're comfortable and they're, and they're going to continue to enjoy what they do at that point. As far as discounts, I mean, look, it's part of marketing. You have to have promotions. You have to give people the opportunity to shop. It's, it's the way of the world. And, and, you know, we always like to try to find cool and creative ways to do it. And, you know, Dave's been one of the guys I've looked at for years. And when I was still a puppy, he's been one of those creative guys in his events and giveaways and stuff like that. Um, and that's just part of the game. And, and, and blowing out, you know, you don't, you know, you don't blow it out unless it sells. And I'll be honest with you, if I have a good relationship with a lot of these companies, I've called them. I said, look, man, I got X number of boxes of these. And they respect me. I said, you know, there's two things I can do at this point. Either I'm going to blow them out online or do you want to take them back? You know, and maybe we'll bring in some other new product. You got nine out of 10 companies will, will prefer to do that than you blow out their brand. And that's just the way we do it. Because look, to have these relationships, it's a relationship. So you want to respect what they need. You don't want to do anything that'll hurt a brand or a company. But then again, if I'm stuck on 50 or hundred boxes or something that ain't moving, you know, you, I either got to get rid of it or you, you got to help me out and, and do something with it, or, or I'm just going to blow it out. But, I, you know, I, I'll always give the manufacturer the option before we would ever do anything like that. Unless I'm really mad at somebody, which has only happened maybe once. <laughs> I'm twice. 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 All right, Dave, how about you? Uh, I, I run a sale once a year called March Madness. It's the first Friday in March. When I moved to New Hampshire in 1996, I became an S corporation from a partnership, moving it to another state and uh, becoming an S corporation. There's something called Nexus within states. So it had to be a different entity. At the end of that year, we had a good year. The first year we moved to New Hampshire again. We started in Boston in 85. And because of taxes, we ended up uh, moving to New Hampshire uh, because we knew we were going to be doomed. We, we fought and we couldn't win. So uh, I ran away from the state. I came up. And at the end of the year, uh, new account, new state. Uh, I earned $25,000. That was my salary that year. And um, the accountant at the end of the year meets with me and says, uh, you owe $100,000 in taxes. And I said, well, you made a mistake. Go back to work and figure out what it is because uh, I made $25,000. And he says, okay, I'll do it again. He did it again. He came back and said, I did make a mistake. You owe $106,000 in taxes. I'm like, what the hell happened? And he said, that's because you're an S corporation and your inventory is profit. So your inventory larger than it was at the start of the year now becomes profit. So you have to pay tax on that. So I said, well, what the hell do I do? He says, we'll turn inventory into cash. And I ran what I called March Madness sale. Actually, I called it Midnight Madness sale because we opened till midnight over the years. Enough of that shit as I got older and it's just <laughs> March Madness. And I go home at a regular time. 
that I put everything on sale and, and the items that were dead items for me, uh, I put to rock bottom prices, even losing on some of them. And in one day, I moved all the product out that I needed to get out of the, out of the building uh, that was dead. And at the same time, uh, didn't hurt anybody's brand or anything because it was never advertised or promoted at all. It was gone so quick. And I made my $108,000. And I said, oh, I'll never do that again. And here it is all those years later. That was 1996. Wow. Uh, I still do it every single year because as, as, as good has happened to me, uh, our business grows every single year. So I end up having this issue all the time. Now, what I learned also is there's a lot of stores that end up having the $5 bin. So things they're trying to dump out, they'll put in a pile and you might've seen it in other people's stores and stuff. Well, what you've created now is a, is a mooch market and certain customers are going to come in only for the items that are in that closeout section that you lose money on. And I never wanted that to happen. So we do it once a year. That's it. And, and it just pulled off like a Band-Aid. It is true. Sometimes I only see some of these people once a year. Uh, I mean, we get a thousand people coming through the store within a day, lots of money generated, but not a lot of profit because it's all the stuff I'm getting rid of. But I'm able to get rid of everything every single year and, and get rid of that product and it's over. And we do it in March, which is a slow time in New England. You got to imagine so, sometimes snowstorms, uh, zero degree temperatures, and a thousand people show up and they're standing outside in line to come in. It's, it, it, it's like the running of the brides for the bridal things. It's the craziest thing you ever saw. But at least it's not that... Um, that pain. Now, I used to let the manufacturers actually come to it and stand in front of their product. But over the years, you could just see they were butthurt because at that point, it was, you know, they'd walk in to see if any of their brands were on the discount thing you know and right. i said ah it's better for them not to even see the pain it'll just be gone the next day they'll come back all their products gone and we'll we'll uh change it up from there right these cigars you know we're we're, not, we're we, we sell a premium product i never liked the deep discounting thing that goes on it's disrespectful for the brands to begin with i know some manufacturers make brands for that very purpose but you know here we are trying to sell the ten dollar version and they're making a three dollar version that's out there and that ends up hurting the brand across the board anyway i've had the conversation with manufacturers and say you're disrespectful to the to your own brand the name's on it as a three dollar version well it's a different product nobody knows it's a different product and you guys know the brands i'm talking about that, that do such a thing and put their names on it um it ends up hurting their brand in the long run because the we're in a premium product like like the Mont Blanc pen and you know you're not going to see rolex discount uh lowered you're not going to see any of these things uh i believe um jeff and abe we all sat on um the davidoff advisory board and you know this this came to me once that i w i was spanked one time by davidoff for dis discounting a product and it was a gift pack that they made years ago um i don't know if it was a nine cigar sampler or whatever it was but it was 106 dollars and as a retailer you know 106 dollars is not a good price to be because 99 dollars is so much cheaper than $106. Yeah. It's going to make a huge difference of the sale. And I, I just did it. And they didn't like it. And they said, you, you broke the contract, blah, blah, blah. And, and they spanked me for it. And I said, okay, I just thought it's so stupid. So I created for them a $99 pack. I'm pretty sure, Jeff, you were there. And I did a show and tell and put this thing together for them. And I said, here it is. $99. And this is the one you should make. Everybody on the board of advisors is like, yeah, yeah, that's the one. And they shot it down and it was over. And, the, and because the $106 oh. one went to $132, which should have been $129, but it was $132. And they continue to do this, uh, whatever they do, for whatever reason they do it. But uh, no, I, I'm not a, a discounter. Um, you know, the, 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 if, if I can't show value in the clean, comfortable atmosphere that I provide, the customer service that I provide, then uh, I'm no good. And uh, the race to the bottom is never, never a good 
good way to, to be, in my opinion. Oh, good. Interesting. Jeff, how about you? So I agree. Uh, Abe really covered it well. Um, I do something a little bit differently, though, on the uh, stuff that that just isn't turning. Uh, we let it kind of die quietly. And what I mean by that is we, we do grab bags and we'll just we'll just, you know, it's 10 cigars for I don't remember. It's thirty nine or forty nine dollars. Um, so they go in a grab bag, you know, and uh, we're, we're selling them at cost that way. Or we, we'll have a little humidor. It's the buy one, get one free. And that's how we turn um, that inventory. So, and, and for us, you know, brands that just don't make it, that's a continual process. So um, every time there's a new brand that comes in is when, it, when it's the retail store, because you only have X amount of retail space. Yeah, you can't, you can't fit, you know, if a shelf holds a hundred boxes, it's a hundred boxes, right? So if a new brand comes in, there's something's got to come out and it's all based on performance. So if stuff doesn't turn, we need to, we need to get rid of it. So instead of having it, uh, you know, doing a big, you know, whatever, 50% off sale or whatever, we'll just let it go quietly because as Abe said, um, you can have, manufacturers where it, it hurts that brand for them where it might sell somewhere else. And I don't want to do that. You know, so there's some brands that just don't work for us. Right. So I don't, because if we advertise that we're closing something out because it didn't sell, that's damaging for that product and for that company. Yeah. Yeah. So instead we're just going to put it in the, you know, grab bags, buy one, get one freeze and, and let it uh, work its way through the system. How many um, times have you done that though? And then the consumers come back looking for it on the shelf all of a sudden. <laughs> well, it, it is what it is. They didn't support. The only reason they look for it on the shelf is because they got it at half price. Yeah, that's the problem. They didn't buy it at the other price, so right. so you know, then they they'll later pick up another grab bag. And 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 you know, Dave, you're right. There's guys that are going to come in just for the grab bag. But you know what? We need those guys because they're like the catfish in the in the aquarium. You know, they got to they're they're eating the eat through the poop in the in the store that we don't need. You know, so so we we need the guys to. To, to buy those cigars and, and get them off the shelves. So, uh, but MSRP is important and in, in, in on certain things for, um, for example, you know, Davidoff holds true to their price and, and that's important. Uh, that's why that brand is, is uh, people, people see it, they respect it and they know what they're getting and they know it's not going to be footballed around. So um, I do like the brand integrity and I think there's a lot of value uh, for long term for a brand. That's what makes it trusted. So, um, you know, there's there's brands that are meant to be discounted. There's brands that are, are meant to not be discounted. Uh, also, what we've done, um, you know, if we see a, a, a certain, you know, market for a certain cigar that, you know, guys that want a three dollar cigar, uh, I'd rather not do the, the thing where you, you, you try to take somebody's seven dollar cigar and sell it for three. And it's like, well, you know, you could get this. I'm not going to use a brand name, but let's say brand X that's on a retailer shelf versus brand X. And it's the exact same brand, but sold through one of the major uh, Internet companies. Know that they're not the same cigar, even though it has the same band on it. They didn't come from the same factory. So um, I don't. We're a trusted company. We've got a reputation that we want to protect and we don't want to uh, ever tell someone they're getting something for three bucks. And it's the same as what's on a retailer shelf for 10 when it's not the same cigar. So uh, we don't, we don't play the game. Very good. Coop, I think any good retailer has to develop a process to prune. I, I call it pruning. You got to prune your humidor. You know, Jeff's right. There's only so much linear space, yeah. whether your grab bags, your annual sale or cut. I mean, we're, we, we have two or three vehicles that really that's how we wean them out, because otherwise you'll die by inventory. Yeah. And you don't have room to bring in new brands because there, there are those retailers, too. They're looking at the same brands on the shelf for years and they got no room to bring in new brands because they're waiting for something to sell out to bring in the new brand. And you can't do that either. Good point. And right. by the way, Dave, Dave mentioned too the thing about uh, inventory is an asset and you got to pay taxes on it. I know that happened to me three years in the Corona cigar. I ran into the same thing. 
Um, so anybody that's running any type of business, whether it's retail cigars, retail, anything else, just remember, if you increased your inventory by $100,000 in value, you're going to have to pay $38,000 in tax on that, even though you don't have that $38,000 in your bank account. Yep. So uh, uh, new businesses, that was one of the toughest lessons that I think all of us learned the hard way uh, because the accountant says you made all this money and, and you're like, well, where is it? Yeah. And because uh, and it's not in the checkbook, uh, but he's but they're like, no, it's on the shelf. And now you got to pay taxes on it. So a lot of people don't understand uh, how, you know, uh, how much you, you pay when you're growing a company, you, you're, you're paying so much in taxes on all that inventory. Um, but it's and, and, and if you're not careful, yeah, you can get smacked where you uh, where you got a big bill and not enough money to pay for it. So we learned that lesson probably third year in business, kind of like what Dave was saying there. And uh, we, we, we never let that happen again after that. I could learn something on that. That's I never knew this. All right. Last question of the night. I'm turning this one over to Loomis. Aaron, this one's yours. <laughs> all right. Uh, so cigar clubs. You all have them in some sort of a fashion um, and have gone through various iterations of those. Um, how do they work for your for your stores? Um, and, you know, do you see a continued benefit benefit for those uh, in, I guess, also with the work that has to go into them to create, you know, unique, unique packs each month or whatever, week that you guys go through them? Start with Dave. So I, I never want to throw a bunch of crap in. Uh, I know those those things exist. I've been doing a Cigar of the Month club for, my God, it's got to be 25 years anyway. And, um, you know, hard to end up doing it. And uh, as time goes on and shipping costs go up because you include shipping in this, this is one flat rate that ends up being there. It gets tougher and tougher. Uh, so um, the, I did the math and, and the work that goes into it of packing these up, which takes three days just to assemble the packs and the, 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 the people to do it um, and to acquire the cigars to end up doing it, which is months in advance to end up getting it. Uh, at the end of the thing, I don't think it's a profitable thing, to be honest with you, of the pack. But what is a get does get accomplished is the person is receiving four or five cigars, whatever your, your pack is of something they may have never tried before. Now, hopefully is what's going to happen is they end up liking one of those cigars. And then they, the next call is, Oh, get me a box of those. I like them. Yeah. So it, it's a way for somebody to sample and it doesn't cost you money to have it sampled. Hopefully you're breaking even make, maybe making a few bucks, but certainly not the cash, you know, a cash cow type of thing, uh, although it looks like it because it adds up to so much money, you start cramping down the numbers and see what it comes down to. Um, you know, it, it, especially like the December one that goes out, I try to put something really special in it. And, you know, that, that cigar could be the cost, the single cigar could be the cost of the whole package. So that one is a definite loss uh, that's happening and it, it just keeps going around. But I never end up stopping it because I do see, the sales that happen after the fact and just a heads up on me too my battery says it's getting close in case i drop off uh i got a, i got a little left to go 10 percent. okay, okay. Right. We're, we're wrapping it up yep yep how about you jeff i know you got uh two different kind of uh levels of cigar of the month club yeah so the reason we had to do that is that we started the cigar of the month club in 1998 and i kept it at that same price forever uh, even though the cigars kept going up because it's really hard to raise your price on a, on a subscription uh, type of program. So uh, yeah, while it wasn't profitable, it is a monthly connection to the customer, which is really important because you don't want to be out of sight, out of mind. Um, so that, that's important. Um, and then we, ha we, we had the requests of people saying, you know, um, we don't want the, the that price range of cigar. We want this like a, a, a super premium one. So, uh, and, and especially because they couldn't get access to those in a lot of their shops. So that's why we introduced the uh, the premium cigar of the month uh, club, which is obviously more money, but you're putting in some really high end cigars. So uh, again, it's it's one of those things where it may not be a, a really profitable thing to do. But it is that whole, just like Dave said, you know, gets people to try stuff and then, um, you know, then try it and then buy it. 
So that's the key. But I think the most important thing is just to, it helps keep that that uh, connectivity to the customers. Mm -hmm. All right, Abe, I know you have a Scar of the Month as well as the Connoisseur Club. So it's kind of an, a unique kind of twist on it as well. So how does that work out for you? Well, I, I'm the, by far the newest, you know, in this game. Um, yeah, no. So when we look, you know, part of my old career is I, I watch people who are successful, right? I mean, they, they obviously are successful for a reason. And you, I've always tried to, whether it be, you know, the Great Smoke wasn't the first multi-vendor cigar event. You know, you just try to make it better in, in a way that's unique to you and a different kind of experience. And, and we've built our whole company always around creating experiences, right? When I interview people, I say, what do you think we sell here for a living? And the first answer they always say is cigars. I'm like, no. No one's ever walked out of my shop saying that was the best Romeo Real they ever had, right? It's the same Romeo Real you would get from Dave or Jeff. It's it's how they're treated from the moment they walk through the door. That's what they're going to remember when they walk out. So we've always been very experienced. And so I actually, you know, when I first created our website, you, everybody has Cigar of the Month Club. I saw Jeff have his. And so we I did it. And I, I, I couldn't, it was terrible and it was all manually written and whatever. So I think it lasted maybe a year, a year or two, and it just went away and we just didn't revisit it. And, and over the years now, as we grow, we got to have our own coding guys, our own in-house graphic guys. You know, when we started, I did all the graphics myself. I have a you know graphic background and, um, I really decided it was time. I thought we could really make a good one because because we do ours differently. Because so people who work for me, I, I, over the years, I've seen everybody have a different way on how they uh, let their employees smoke cigars. I've seen guys as well, they get one free cigar a day or two free cigars a day, whatever. Basically, you know, my way, I always run my business, look, you can pay cost. If it's for your personal consumption, because I want these guys to know the brands. I want them to enjoy them. If the rep doesn't come in and they get a complimentary one from them, them, I don't want to be free to try a brand. You pay what I pay. <laughs> you know what I mean? When I grab a cigar from the humidor, I didn't get it for free. I, it cost me something. So they pay costs. And I'd rather they explore and they, they learn and they, they get the horizon. So I kind of took that principle and kind of did it for the consumers, right? So, you know, and Dave's right. I mean, these aren't profit centers. By the time you figure the labor packing, getting it all together, postage, it's not a profit center, but it is a connectivity to consumers. And I can't tell you how many times we've seen people post and say, man, I would have never tried that brand. And that, that's when I know we're doing the right thing. Uh, you know, our club, it's not a sale club. We actually limit it to one membership per household. We don't want the guy who wants 10 subscriptions because he knows he's getting, you know, $60 worth of cigars or $50 worth of cigars for $29.95. You know, this is about really trying something and not having to pay retail price to try it. And you hopefully you find something you like and you come back and buy it. So, and, and it's, it's been my personal baby. So I literally pick the five cigars out every month. It never comes out of my inventory. We, I, I look for cigars, new cigars, old classics. Maybe I think people haven't tried in a while. I, I curate the five cigars. We go out, we buy them. They go in the cigar of the month club. Um, so that's how we ran our club. And, it, and it's, it's been very well for us. It's, and, and it is a connection to the consumer because some people have found us just because of our Cigar of the Month Club and then become customers. And that's, that's what you hope at the end of the day. The kind of sort of club was a whole different beast. That was a COVID baby. You know, that was one of Dave Garofalo's crazy ideas, you know, that he's talking about, you know, um, because people wanted a different kind of club. And I'm like, I, what kind, I can't do another kind of club. You know, it, it's hard to get, see, oh, I can get, especially when your number becomes so big, you know, I can't curate so many rare cigars every month. Uh, I'll run out of options in three months, you know? Yeah. So, it, it, you know, the model of our club works because there's new cigars coming out all the time, you know? So there's, there, there really is a, a never ending resource of options for me, the way we run our regular cigar of the month club. So then we came out the connoisseur club, which is really crazy, but it's totally experience driven where we have manufacturers literally make, blends just for the club it's a very small club they don't know what they're smoking they get them unbanded they get a qr code they smoke them because i believe the blind experience of smoking a cigar breaking down the barriers of any kind of preconceptions of mm -hmm. what a brand is or where they got it from 
is a, a different kind of experience. So they smoke them, they log in, they enter in all their notes, how they rate them, they get their own, keep their own personal library. And 30 days later, we, we reveal to them who made the cigar with a video from the manufacturer telling about their blend. And this was our first year doing it. We're coming on our 12th month of the Connoisseur Club. And it's been a really cool experience and the program has been tweaked throughout the year. And we're very, very excited for next year because we have like, oh man, I think we got like, 20 new companies involved next year. Mm -hmm. Some of the companies really kind of get excited over it because it's their way for them to experiment outside of their maybe normal comfort zone or what they normally produce because they don't have to worry about I'm building a brand, right? Mm -hmm. So let me let me experiment. Let me try this cool little blend idea I was thinking about and they'll do a very small run for our group. And look, kudos to all the manufacturers who participate in that program for us because you can ask anybody, nobody wants to make 600 cigars. Yeah. You know, no, 700, no, nobody wants to do that. It's a pain in the ass. I know C. Saka says probably fuck you, Abe, every time. <laughs> Good for me. I, I literally know he says it. He's, so, he's um, that now, yep. <laughs> I'm positive he says it. So right. kudos to him. But no, I, I think it's become a very important tool uh, for connectivity, for consumers to explore, try new stuff and do it where it's not costing them full price. So they end up coming across something that's not their cup of tea. It's, it's not that, that bad of experience. It doesn't hurt the wallet that much either. Right. Nice job, Abe. Nice job, guys. All right. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up. But before we kind of wrap up with, with you three, um, I just want to announce next week's shows. I think folks are going to want to hear this. Uh, we have two shows next week. Uh, Bear and I will be doing special edition 111. Uh, the topic will be everyday smokes. So we're going to do a show on everyday smokes. We haven't done anything like that. And Aaron, I guess I dropped the bombshell now. Yeah, do it. Okay. Do it. Uh, this has just been booked today. This is probably going to floor a lot of people uh, for next week's guest um, for a lot of reasons. But um, primetime episode 212. Uh, that's December 9th. Uh, we'll be back at 10 p.m. Uh, we have Brian Desen, the Pravada Cigar Club, will be the guest. He's agreed to do the show, and uh, we will be welcoming him on the show next week to talk about uh, what he's doing. So we appreciate that as well. I know folks are going to want to tune in for that one for sure. Uh, Dave, Jeff, um, Abe, thank you guys so much. I know we guys kept you late. Yes. Uh, look forward to having you guys on, you know, individual shows. And I'd love to do this again because there was a ton of topics I thought of during this show. So maybe we'll make this an annual thing as well. We're in. It was an honor to be on, man. Yep. Great. Yes, thank and, you, guys. Yep. And then Abe will be on, in, uh, Abe will be on special edition with Bear and I in January. We'll be doing a great smoke show uh, preview so as, as well. So we right. actually in target for the next one. So uh, honored to be on here with all you gentlemen. Thank, thank you so th much. Thank you. This was really a learning me. experience. Yeah, real learning experience for us. All right. Uh, I guess that's it. That's going to wrap up uh, prime time episode 211 to the annals of history for Tuesday, December 2nd. Now Wednesday, December 3rd on the East Coast. We'll see everybody next week. Take care, everybody. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>